Okay, folks, um, good morning to you all to the weekly meeting of the ERA committee. Uh, we're corded and we're, we're distant out. Um, today's meeting will receive a briefing from the Research and Information Service, two oral briefings from the Department on the revised uh, bovine tuberculosis uh, policy and the common frameworks on uh, resources and waste policy. There will also be two EU exit SRs and a number of departmental uh, written briefings. Um, okay, I want to also advise you now at this point that we're going to have to go briefly into closed session for a few minutes uh, to consider a response on EU exit issues. I could ask the broadcasting to ensure that all witnesses have left the meeting by Starleaf. And can I ask a broadcasting to now add all members into the spotlight to ensure the staff can remain in the meeting? This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. Okay, we're back in open session here. Um, Patsy, uh, T Patsy, Claire, Philip and John and Morris, you are very welcome uh, by Starleaf. Um, as we know from before, uh, the committee will be broadcast and recorded throughout Parliament Buildings and online. Okay, uh, with no apologies, um, Chairperson's Business, we've already discussed the letters and closed, um, and closed session uh, there now. Um, and we agreed to issue the letters, subject to uh, uh, Patsy's um, um, request. The draft minutes uh, <coughs> uh, from the meeting on the 17th of December is at pages 21 to 34, and the draft minutes from the meeting on the 7th of January is at page 35 to 38. Members okay if I sign those minutes? Okay. Um, any particular matters? There's no particular matters arising, is there? Okay. Uh, so the item five on the agenda, we're going to have an oral briefing from the Research and Information Service uh, on the agriculture policy developments, um, uh, <coughs> agriculture policy developments, uh, both here in the south of Ireland and <coughs> in other uh, jurisdictions. Um, we we'll recall on the 19th of November that we. Uh, received a briefing from dear officials on the development of a new agriculture policy uh, for here. We also heard from the UFU in the same date on that issue. At that point, the committee agreed to commission some research on the key components to agricultural strategy in other jurisdictions. I want to refer members to the raised briefing paper at pages 41 to 64. And I'd also like to welcome uh, by Starleaf, uh, Mark Allen, the research officer. Mark, oh, Mark. Good to see you, Mark. Yes, sir. Mark, do you want to maybe start your, your briefing there and then members will uh, have asked a few questions of you? Thank you, Chair. Hopefully you can hear me and see me clearly. Yes, Mark, we can indeed. Uh, with your permission, um, I'm going to use a, a few PowerPoint slides here, just might make it easier for you to follow along. Um, so I'll just share the screen here, um, if you bear with me. Uh, it seems to be... Can you see that? Yes, yes. Can okay, no, I will just... Right, yeah. Okay, um, 
Basically, as I said, I'm here today to talk about um, agri agricultural um, policy developments. Uh, this paper, I suppose, was written, um, as you'll be aware, um, just before the, the Mark, Christmas Mark, recess. Mark, just, there's, some, yes. there's some wee discrepancy with your screen there. It's flashing uh, off and on um, quite Okay. But is there something that you could do on your side there? Or Hang on. Just to, and I will try it, Chair. Just give me a minute. All right. No block. Um, uh, uh, can you see me there or can you hear me now because yeah. it, it seems to be a problem with my actual powerpoint i think when i try to share it yeah we can uh, it's settled now mark yes it's okay. settled now Apologies, it's, it's one of the, as you many of you will recognise, the challenge of a, a rural area with a broadband connection, which isn't great. Um, but I, I will try and persevere here. Um, so, oh, it's incredibly slow here. Yes, t my t t paper today um, is looking at agricultural policy developments, both predominantly really across the UK and Ireland uh, and other selected jurisdictions. And as, as you'd said, Chair, the, the actual paper is on pages 41 to 64. A um, couple of things to say. This is a very fluid topic. Um, there's been a number of developments since the publication of the paper on the 14th of December. A number of key ones as follows. Um, first being that the, the EU budget or the multi-annual financial framework for the 2021 to 27 period, that was finally approved by the European Parliament and the European Council. Uh, in the form of their regulation uh, by the 17th of December. The reason I flag that is that we now have a definitive idea as to what Ireland's overall allocation is for the next cap period. That equates to 10.5 billion euros. 8.3 billion of that is for direct payments and 2.25 billion for rural development. That's broadly the same in percentage terms as the 2014 uh, program period that began in 2014. But uh, I think it's important to note that it's, it's actually less money that can be spent on direct payments this time. So uh, Irish farmers are probably looking at something like a 2% cut. Can you still hear me there? Perfect, yeah. Okay, thank you. The other thing that uh, happened again then on the 16th of December, post the paper being published, was that the Welsh government actually published their Agriculture Wales white paper. Um, I suppose setting out I suppose their thoughts. This is an uh, advance of the Act, which they hope to bring within a new um, Welsh Parliament term. The consultation on that white paper is actually open until the 23rd of March. Uh, and the main theme or aim within it is really sustainable land management and the part that farming plays within that. Uh, the other thing that was announced in relation to that white paper uh, production was that the basic payment scheme will continue up to 2022. The critical thing is supposed to be subject to funding. And then it will be replaced by a single direct support scheme for farmers. But beyond that, we don't have a lot of detail. Um, more, more locally then, um, DERA uh, on the 17th of December actually opened their public consultation on their proposed pilot uh, protein crop scheme. Um, I'm not going to give a lot of detail on that. You can read it, and I'm sure you've probably even taken a briefing from it. One of the key things is that there's a proposed payment rate of £330 per hectare there for selected uh, protein crops. And the, the final thing before I turn to the actual paper itself, the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol, um, the decision of the Withdrawal Agreement Joint Committee um, on Agricultural Subsidies was actually published on the 17th of December. Why that's significant is it set out the ceiling for agricultural subsidies in Northern Ireland that will be exempted from EU state aid rules. So the initial figure that was in that um, was 382.2 million. Now there is some capacity uh, for that figure to be increased or for some to be carried over. I'm not, uh, you can read that, I'm sure you've heard about it. I think it's just useful probably at this point to get the headline figure. The interesting thing is that is subject to review by the Joint Committee, but I have really still seeking clarity on how often that review will occur. Um, and I, I think that is interesting, but that's, I suppose, an effect of the envelope within which um, the Executive and the Agriculture Minister can, I suppose, provide subsidies for agriculture, that 382.2 million. 
Turning to the, the actual paper, um, I'm, I'm just going to very quickly draw your attention to some of the main themes. I'm happy to take questions at the end. Really, I suppose across the UK, there are two distinct policy periods um, in relation to agricultural policy. There's this transition period, really between 2021 and 2024, and then a longer term strategic direction beyond 2024. Within Ireland, it's a, a different situation because the transition to the new uh, cap really is running from 2021 to 22, and the new cap actually goes operational in 2023 and completes in 2027. Turning back again to the UK, um, England really does seem to be the most advanced in relation to their agricultural policy plans and their support schemes both up to and beyond 2024. Uh, by comparison, uh, Scotland, Wales and ourselves in Northern Ireland have not published or announced propos proposals as detailed as those available in England at the time of writing. Um, I think it's important to note that the, the progress in the longer term strategic direction for agricultural policy in Scotland and Wales in particular is contingent uh, upon the production of dedicated um, Scottish and Welsh Agriculture Acts, which are unlikely to be delivered within the current parliamentary terms. Um, the work towards those acts is being supported by the development of, a, as I mentioned, the White Paper in Wales. And in Scotland, we're still waiting uh, for a report from the Farming and Food Production Future Policy uh, Group in Scotland that had been actually set up by the Scottish Government. And there was some sense that that might have been imminent pre-Christmas, but as yet, I, am, I have not seen any public um, documents or final publication from them, but I'm keeping an eye on that. I think the other thing to stress, uh, both uh, previously and indeed going forward, all the UK jurisdictions, consultation and stakeholder involvement have been, are and will be key. I mean, there's a number I mentioned, the, the protein crops locally. In England, if, you know, if you look even on the table that I provided you for things that are happening in 2021, there's quite a bit which involves stakeholder engagement and consultation. Um, other thing just to flag is that across the UK and Ireland, there are broad similarities with regards to agricultural policy priorities and aims. And there are common themes such as sustainability, climate change mitigation, productivity, resilience, effective supply chain operation, uh, and rewards for public goods provision and profitability. And those are appearing across all the UK and Irish jurisdictions and EU jurisdictions in various iterations. I have to say at this point, there really is too little detail in proposals within Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, um, particularly as they relate to the period beyond 2024, to enable any direct comparison with the proposed schemes outlined for England. Also, I have to say that it remains unclear um, how UK common framework requirements in areas such as agricultural support will sit with policy directions and specific scheme design across the UK administrations. And I think I also have to say that there are very clearly budgetary issues. Um, UK government to maintain the funding available to farmers and land managers in every year of the, the current parliament needs to be considered within the context of the UK government confirming their plans to repeal the Fixed uh, Term Parliaments Act. Um, and there are also questions around funding commitments beyond 2022. Indeed, um, if any of you have been following the press, that has been a, a familiar theme uh, from the Scottish Government over the last number of weeks. Um, I think another thing I just want to flag is there is a major uh, difference between both the future UK and, and, and Ireland EU approaches is a move away from the cap model of support for farmers and wider rural development within the UK. So as we move towards um, the proposed UK Share Prosperity Fund, um, we still have a real lack of detail around the UK Share Prosperity Fund, um, both on the medium and the long term, never mind the short term. And I suppose there are significant questions around how rural communities will or can receive a fair share of that funding. Um, I'm not going to dwell too much on the final part of the paper because it, it's there for you and it's, it's information I really collated from the OECD. But we did look at a number of other jurisdictions, which for those of you who were with the, the committee back in 2016 will be familiar. Um, we looked at uh, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, Norway, Switzerland and the United States. A number of those countries at various points had um, been mentioned in relation to what the UK's future Brexit, post-Brexit relationship might look like with the EU. Um, it's, I suppose the interesting thing in terms of that is page 59 onwards in your pack. 
of all those countries we looked at, uh, with a notable exception of Norway and Switzerland, direct payment provisions for farmers are minimal. Um, the main focus on support, in fact, in the majority of the countries, such as Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the US, relate to support services and market intervention tools. And um, I suppose it's fair to say that their most recent policy developments are largely dominated by climate change mitigation measures within a wider context of farming and environmental sustainability. Chair, that's probably all I want to, to say at this stage, um, but I'm happy to, to take any questions. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, very in, on, informative, uh, as always, and uh, a very good paper that, that, that's well laid out and which is uh, understandable. Um, I suppose, Mark, there's, I suppose there's, a, there's a couple of things that that concerns me, and you did highlight it in your paper, is is the the divergence, the divergence of um, Britain away from the common agricultural policy, um, and the particular impact it will have here on the island of Ireland. Because, as you know, the um, particularly for the um, processing lines. We know we export 800 million litres of milk to the south every year, and we import 450,000 pigs, and we export half a million lambs. Um, I'm just concerned that if you're going to have that uh, di divergence, um, you know, uh, and we see more clarity in the south in terms that there's them sitting with a, a confirmed budget of 10 billion, and we're, we're not certain about what's going to happen here. What's your assessment of, of the potential impact uh, on the competitiveness, competitiveness of our agriculture producers here uh, if, if that divergence uh, becomes um, an issue or becomes greater? I think, Chair, at this point, it is, it's hard to make a definitive assessment because we, we still, I suppose, don't have um, the detailed um, policy proposals from DARA. Um, and I don't understand the minister, and, and as you all listened to, and in fact, you took the briefing. Um, he had set out the broad headline areas, um, and I know that you know competitiveness and resilience and supply chains were, were things that he, he mentioned in his speech to the house. But in terms of actually seeing um, the detail of those, that's not something I have at this point. So I'm not going to be in a position to make a you know a comment or assessment. I think your point in relation to divergence, um, I think, is is a very real threat um, in terms of both priorities or supports. Um, you know, I, I think it could be an issue. For example, it, it, I don't know the exact numbers, but I'm no doubt we will have a number of farmers who would have holdings on either side of the border. That will be present particular challenges for those. Um, but in the absence of real detailed information, it's kind of hard to make an assessment around the direction of travel. The only thing I would say is there do seem, does seem to be, a, as I mentioned in the paper, a recognition of the fact that there are many common challenges and issues, um, both across the UK, Ireland, and indeed the wider EU, and as to whether that could provide a basis uh, for broad or similar outcomes for farmers. That might be a hope, but it's an aspiration, maybe without any actual detail at this point. And 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 before I bring in our members, um, what's the latest that you've heard from the, the UK Shared Prosperity Fund? Because obviously, from from for our rural, our, I'm just thinking of our rural communities, our our community organisations, the basic services that we have in our rural communities, most of those um, are there because of funding through the the former EU Rural Development Programme. Um, and obviously, we've seen what happened last year whenever uh, we've lost £34 million because we weren't allowed to carry it over from the previous uh, multi-annual budget. Is there any update at all, Mark, of, uh, of where that UK Shared Prosperity Fund is at? Or any, uh, is there any clarity coming at all? I have to say, Chair, at this point, I had a look at that, that issue again yesterday, um, just to try and inform myself on it again. And, and I have to say there is a complete paucity of information. And indeed, I have to say that, um, doing a bit of reading yesterday, this is a, a frustration right across the UK. Indeed, the local government organisation um, in England had, earlier in the week, um, voiced their frustration at the lack of detail, the lack of engagement with the proposed government task force to deliver this. There was it's meant to be stakeholder engagement. That doesn't appear to be happening. Um, and there are also significant questions 
uh, around how funding will be delivered. Um, is it going to be competitive? Are there going to be allocations for particular themes? Lots that is still undecided. Uh, and I suppose this, the significant frustration, for particularly for a, a lot of local government, was that in England is the fact that we're now uh, post the transition period and they had hoped that these funds were going to be available, I suppose, from early January or at the very least that there would be a, a process and a procedure set out for them to be able to know how to apply. Mark, are you No. Oh, sorry, William, William. Thank you, Mr Chairman, and thank you, Mark, again for your presentation. I suppose, again, as you've already in your previous answer said, um, the level of support we don't know at this stage where what is the level is going to be at in the UK. I think you did say that era or the Republic is a cut of two or three percent. Was it two percent or three? In the budget? Yes, it's it's, it's uh, Ireland in terms of the overall cap, uh, William. There is, if you took it in general terms, it appears there will be roughly a two percent cut for direct payments for farmers from their their previous level. Yeah, well, um, like, that's that's. While it is, that, I suppose it's, it's more. Yeah. Go ahead, sorry. No, while it is a cut, it's, it's, it's quite small, so I suppose it, it won't affect them too badly. Um, no, but, no, that's correct. But I think it, it would be very important, that, or it will leave Northern Ireland and the UK farmers at a big disadvantage of the European counterparts if the level of funding isn't kept at a reasonable level for farmers, isn't that right? Yes, and I think that is, as I mentioned, is the fundamental question beyond really 2022. Um, and I, I did highlight in the paper, um, I mean, the government's announcement that they plan to look at the, are, are going to repeal the Fixed Terms Parliament Act. So if you were a cynic and you said, right, there's a commitment to fund for this parliament, and let's assume that's five years, it may not be five years. Um, it might be, you know, the government could call an election any time with the repeal of the, the Fixed Term Parliament Act. So. I suppose that's, that is really what has animated, as I mentioned, the Scots over the past week in terms of, and indeed the Welsh flagged a similar concern in relation to their white paper to say, look, what's the situation regarding direct payments beyond 2022? And I think that um, very clearly is a concern for us too here in Northern Ireland. Yeah, I think it would be important that all foreign bodies lobby very heavily to ensure that we're not left at a disadvantage, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's I think that is that's where we're at, um, and I suppose it, it's a, maybe a, a key ask in terms of the, the government to actually establish uh, what their plans are beyond that period. Okay, okay. Um, Rosemary. Yeah, um, can you give me a wee bit more detail or your thoughts, sort of, on the shared prosperity fund? How you would see that maybe <coughs> perhaps playing out it within Northern Ireland? <laughs> Uh, I suppose, Rosemary, that's, that's, it's a difficult um, question to answer because there is so little information. I mean, what I would maybe could say is it could be something that maybe might be better going and looking at and coming back to you on. Um, I know I've done a bit of work on that previously, um, but it was, it was into last year and off the top of my head, I can't even remember the, the detail in the paper. But I mean, I, I'd be willing to give you a commitment to go ahead and maybe look at the issue further and come back to you if that would be sufficient. Happy enough, Rosemary? Yes. Uh -huh. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Philip? <clears throat> Philip? Uh, thanks, uh, Chair. Thanks, Mark. Mark, the paper is very interesting, and I, mean, I certainly will support that, that idea of looking at more detail with regard to the shared prosperity. I mean, the paper probably throws up uh, more questions than answers, given that, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty about future policy and uh, funding, and I mean, as, as has already been pointed out, you know, the EU and therefore the South uh, is, is further advanced and, and we can't afford to have our farmers disadvantaged. So, I mean, all of those points have been well made uh, by yourself and others. Just, I mean, I found it interesting that looking through the detail of the, the, the various policies, I mean, the, the, in the cap, you know, they're specifically saying 40% of the overall budget uh, is expected to contribute to uh, climate change action. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and then there's the, the possibility of an additional 15%. So, I mean, that, that, mm -hmm. that's quite a lot uh, that's going specifically to addressing climate action and supporting farmers in the agriculture sector to address that. And yet, in, in ours, I mean, all we have possibly, and without being too content, I mean, we've got flurry language and that's essentially it. We're, we're talking about environmental strategies. We don't actually have specific 
climate change actions uh, rip into your overall pro, uh, overall strategy. So, I mean, I, I think that's something that certainly does need addressed, that, you know, we do need to recognise that climate change is, is a big, big issue, and it does need funding uh, to help agriculture and farmers uh, address that. And, and, I mean, I would be expecting, but certainly hoping, that that, that is the key point in the strategy moving forward. Yeah, I, I think it's it's a it's a fair comment, and as I said, you know, when you compare it to the international um, examples that we cited there, you know, climate change mitigation um, is is a significant feature and recent feature of, of policy developments. Um, I think at this stage, as, as you say, Philip, it's probably too early to say around because we don't have the detail. Um, I think the the concepts of sustainable development, sustainable land management, you could probably say, well, there will be a climate change dimension to those. But in the absence of, of, of detail, it's kind of hard to, to make a definitive assessment as to what scale those will be and how much resource will be actually allocated towards them. Okay, fair enough. No, that's, I mean, that's just the point I wanted to make. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, Claire? Thank you, Chair. Um, and thanks very much for the report. It's really, really interesting. I'll be hanging on to it and going back to it for a wee while, I would imagine. Um, but again, I suppose like everybody else, I mean, and even to quote, it, quote a line in it, you know, it's the scant detail in relation to potential outcomes that really should be concerning us all. And I suppose following on from what Philip was saying there, I'm wondering, can you identify any examples um, or aspects of agriculture policy elsewhere that was done well um, and that could be applied to our own context? Uh, I think that's, that's, a, that's a difficult um, question to answer, Claire, I suppose, because it's, it's a subjective assessment. Um, I mean, the thing I would say is I think, um, and the reason I, I flagged it in my presentation was, I think the commitment to stakeholder engagement and consultation um, both up to this point in time and going forward is probably critical to that. Uh, and I suppose that's something probably uh, that I will be keeping an eye on as opposed to see you know, who's involved and, and what actually they say and whether that's actually taken account of and what's finally developed. Um, because I, I think if it's, a, if it's a participatory process, you would hope that what will come out the other end will be actually something that meets the need of all stakeholders. That's maybe more a, that's maybe a hope than a reality, but I, I think if you look at where good policy has been done that has involved the people who had impacts, um, and I think you know the, the signs there, I suppose, as I said already, are that we've they're already opening consultation in a number of the areas, including the protein crop. So um, it's kind of a wait and see uh, approach at this point. But I mean, it, it is something I'm going to be keeping an eye on, um, and can you know can come back and update you at a further date. All right, just in line with that then, so we know that both Northern Ireland and England's agricultural policies will be informed by the Agricultural Act, so throwing the wheels, mm -hmm. you know, Absolutely. They're working towards their own anyway. So how does Northern Ireland um, compare them with England in terms of how the Act um, has informed current policy or the direction of travel for policy? Well, I think, that, I suppose, in terms of if you go back to, I mean, back earlier in the year when we looked at it, there were a number of areas that um, I suppose we looked at, uh, and I realise the committee probably have different opinions as members in terms of whether we should have a dedicated Northern Ireland Agriculture Act or whether the UK Agriculture Act is sufficient. Suffice to say, I suppose, that the other two devolved jurisdictions are want to do their own thing. Um, that debate, I suppose, is, is, is still going to run and continue. I, I know I noted that Minister Putz had stressed that ideally he would have liked to have had a Northern Ireland Agriculture Act, but at the time was against him. Um, so in terms of provisions, the provisions I have to say in the Northern Ireland uh, um, schedule within the, the actual UK Agriculture Act do provide quite a bit of scope for quite a range of activities. Um, so it wasn't that prescriptive again, but that in many ways, I think, was, as I said last, I think it was February or March, was actually a positive thing because it did give quite a bit of scope for local officials, again, to, to shape both an agriculture support policy um, that would be both, um, I suppose, open to, to ideas and not very tightly regulated by, by the UK government. So that... There's pluses and, and, and minuses, I suppose, in terms of what you have. It's not that detailed, but then that gives you a lot of ch opportunity to write your own and to, to tailor it to what you actually need. 
Okay, so do you feel that the, the sort of current policy uh, and what we're doing at the minute, I mean, there's a lot of buzzwords and you've mentioned yourself about sustainability, mm. resilience, and then the climate me mitigations, but they're all very undefined at the minute. Um, yep. so I'm wondering, you know, is there anything there, you know, how sustainable then to apply those words to, to, to what we're doing is our current direction of travel, given the scant detail, given the lack of direction and, and clarity, um, how sustainable is what we're doing right now? Particularly well, I suppose, I suppose be, trying, to, trying to be fair on it, I suppose it's, it's, there is a lot that still needs to be determined and defined. And, I, I, you know, I think, I think you're right to flag the fact that there needs to be meat on the bones. Um, in terms of how that comes forward, uh, that, that's, a, that's another question, but that's why I flag again, I think consultation is critical to try and ensure that what we get actually delivers on those aspirations uh, and those four priorities locally. Um, I mean, sustainability is, as an issue can be looked at in so many different ways. It could be environmental, it could be for the industry. I mean, uh, you know, one of the things I, I find interesting, for example, looking across England, is the idea of a, a, a lump sum um, to enable farmers, older farmers, to actually leave the sector. Now that, that's a that's a fascinating uh, concept. Um, so let's let's see what happens. Um, but uh, it's really too early for me, I suppose, to make an assessment as to to what's actually going to happen in relation uh, to those issues. Uh, but as I said, I, you know, and I'm given the, the committee the commitment. We're continuing to watch them uh, and to see how things go. Thank you. All right, Claire. Cheers. Yeah, thanks, Chair. No problem. John, John Blair. John, do you hear us? John, we can't hear you. Your audio. No, there he is. Let me know, yeah. Yes, John, um, I can hear you, yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mark, for the, for the report and the detail, the detail in that report. Um, some of the concerns I have that leaks to all around um, environmental and climate commitment have already been covered. But can I ask... Um, if we are to have a further report on engagement and consultation over the Shared Prosperity Fund, that we also try to bring uh, what direct contact has been with our own local government and also uh, with representative organisations such as the Rural Community Network. I'm asking that because we have to bear in mind that how proportionately uh, agriculture affects our economy and, and rural economies. Yeah, and I think that, John, I, I, I'll give a commitment when I, I do that paper that, that um, I responded to Rosemary. I'll see what information there is pertaining to that as to what local engagement there has been or is proposed as well. Is that yeah. happy, are you happy enough if I, I do oh, that? Absolutely, yeah. And I suppose you should have specified from DERA in particular, but also okay. if there are any wider consultations out there, it might be useful to see how our own local rural communities and, and farming um, communities are getting to feed into that consultation. I'm, I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, all members have yet, yeah, okay. So, Mark, I want to, again, thank you as always. Uh, excellent paper and for answering the questions posed by the members this morning. And um, thank you for your attendance, Mark, and no doubt we'll be seeing you again, again during the course of the term. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Members. Okay, Mark. Okay, Members, we're going to move on to Item 6 on the agenda. It's an oral briefing from the Department on the revised uh, bovine tuberculosis uh, policy. Uh, the memo from the clerk is at pages 66 to 70. A written briefing from the Department at 71 <coughs> to 78. I want to welcome uh, via Starleaf Neil Gartland, Director of Animal Health and Welfare Policy, Michael Hutch, Deputy Chief Veterinary Officer, Raymond Kirk TB Strategy uh, v VEU and Wildlife Unit, Seamus Murray TB Policy Implementation Branch. So uh, you can hear me okay there, folks. So um, uh, I would like to just invite you at this point to, uh, to begin their briefing and then members will ask some questions uh, thereafter. Thank you very much, Chair. I'll, I'll lead off on that. Um, so good morning, Chair and, and committee members. Uh, my name is Neve Gartland, uh, as you, you've mentioned, Director of Animal Health and Welfare Policy. Um, can I firstly introduce my colleagues who are here with me online today? Michael Hatch, Deputy Chief Veterinary Officer, uh, Raymond Kirk, Senior Veterinary Officer, and Seamus Murray, Head of TB Policy. And should the IT gremlins come in, Chair, um, I'll join by phone and I'll actually mislead off on the, 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 the speech should anything happen. 
thank you for the opportunity afforded to me and my colleagues to, to bring the committee up to date with the current position on our bovine tuberculosis program and on the development of a new bovine TB eradication strategy for Northern Ireland. Given the importance of bovine TB program in Northern Ireland animal health, our farmers and trade, and the amount of work that is currently taking place on finalising a new eradication strategy, this update is, is very timely. Bovine tuberculosis is an infectious disease of cattle and is one of the most challenging animal health issues facing governments, including ourselves, across the UK and Ireland. It is caused by the bacterium, Microbacterium bovis, which can also infect and cause disease in many other mammals, including humans, deer, goats, pigs, cats, dogs and badgers. In cattle, it is mainly a respiratory disease, but clinical signs are rare. The Northern Ireland Bovine TB programme facilitates access to external markets by our export-dependent livestock and livestock product production sectors. The programme supports trade of over $1.5 billion per year for our industry. And as part of this programme, DEER conducts annual herd tests for TB, with more frequent testing of breakdown in at-risk herds. And animals which test positive for BTB are compulsory slaughtered, with compensation paid at full market value, uh, 100%. A fall in disease levels contributed to a £4 million reduction in compensation costs in 2019-20 compared to the previous year, lowering the overall government course cost of our programme to just over £36 million. We have seen this decline in disease levels since additional disease control measures were introduced in early 2018, and the estimated cost for 2020-21 is approximately £36 million again, which includes additional gamma testing costs. It's also acknowledged that there's a cost to farmers of complying with the TB testing programme, particularly for cattle compulsory removed, and this is of course in addition to the stress that farming families can experience. However, while our current position is slightly more encouraging than it was in 2017 and 2018, recent disease statistics indicate that the decline in BTB incidence has now plateaued. It is also important to note, though, that through the introduction of testing easements during the 2020 uh, pandemic due to COVID restrictions, this may have an impact on disease statistics in the coming months. We all accept that the cost of controlling BTB here remains much too high, both in terms of the cost to the public purse and in relation to the impact it has on our farmers and farm businesses. This cost and the challenge of making substantial progress in reducing the level of BTB here has led to scrutiny of our approach. A Northern Ireland Audit Office report in 2018, while concluding that our programme provided value for money in terms of its importance to our beef and dairy industry, noted that the high level of public expenditure on BTB in Northern Ireland had failed to reduce disease levels in line with the objectives of the programme compared to the programme on February with progress made elsewhere in Europe. It is clear that we need to do more and work smarter together, in particular with the farming community and indeed with all of our key stakeholders to tackle this disease. On coming into office in January, Minister Putz made clear that reducing BTB levels and implementing a BTB eradication strategy was and still remains one of his top priorities. Since then, he has worked closely with the Chief Veterinary Officer and other policy and veterinary colleagues to urgently progress work on a new eradication strategy for Northern Ireland. And I will now turn to update you on this work. As some of you will be aware, the development of our proposed eradication strategy began in 2014 when the then DARD Minister Michelle O'Neill MLA established an independent TB strategic partnership group, the TBSPG, to advise the department and to develop a long-term strategy and implementation plan to eradicate BTB from Northern Ireland. The TBSPG undertook a significant exercise in identifying best practice elsewhere and extensively engaged with stakeholders, presenting its report to then dear Minister Michelle McElveen MLA in December 2016. It concluded that eradicating BTB would be a long-term objective, estimating that eradication could take up to 40 years to achieve and would require all of the factors which contribute to the spread and endurance of this costly disease to be addressed. The TBSPG made over 30 recommendations spread across a number of thematic areas, including governance, cattle testing, herd health, finance and research. They also made proposals relating to the role played by wildlife in TB spread. <laughs> In the absence of the devolved administration, the department issued its response to the TBSPG recommendations through a public consultation. Over 200 responses were received from across all key stakeholders, interested party and the public to this consultation, which closed in February 2018. Around this time, in the face of rising disease levels, the department took action and did bring forward some important recommendations made by the TBSPG and put them into practice. This included a number of additional cattle control measures, introducing a more stringent interpretation of the skin test, and providing herd keepers with additional biosecurity advice on a more formal basis, delivered by testing veterinarians. It is worth noting that, as mentioned earlier, disease levels are currently around 15% lower now than they were before these additional measures were introduced. In May 2018, the department established the TB Eradication Partnership, TBEP, a further TBSPG recommendation to provide independent expert advice on the development and implementation of the new strategy. 
The TBIBS membership is drawn from the farming community and food processing sector and contains members from a scientific, veterinary, food processing and environmental background. One of its key priorities and role is to engage with stakeholders and represent their views to the department as we progress to finalise the eradication strategy. Following consideration of the responses to the DEER consultation, officials continue to work on preparing a draft strategy for a future minister. In the absence of a minister, the departmental board and the permanent secretary agreed a way forward on the strategy in August 2019. This involved developing the recommendations across the six thematic areas outlined and included options relating to badger intervention and possible changes to compensation arrangements for an incoming minister to consider. Since coming into post, the minister has worked closely with officials to finalise the strategy. Importantly, officials have also been working at pace on an associated business case required to underpin the final proposals the Minister may wish to bring forward. I am pleased to advise the Committee that this work is now nearing completion and the Minister will be presenting his pros way forward in the coming months once the work outlined is finally completed. And we are happy to answer any questions that the Committee may have. And thank you very much, Chair. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Fiona. Very informative, and the and for the written briefing that uh, we received as well. Um, there's a couple. There's a couple of there members have indicated they want to ask some questions, and um, I will. I will perhaps kick off here. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that we we have noted that uh, as a consequence of of Brexit, we have lost. Uh, we will lose 15 million pound over the course of three years to the EU fund for disease eradication. What impact will that have on the department's ability to grapple and get to, get to terms uh, with with the disease and indeed with your your future strategy for addressing it? What, what chair is you know where the the European Commission had redefined TB as a, as a priority disease within uh, the money it provides for eradication strategies across Europe in the, in the past number of years. So what we would have expected uh, in t this year uh, that has to be approved through our program uh, is about 1.85 million euros. Um, and as a result of, of the UK leaving the EU and not applying to third um, country programmes, following this point, that, that will be lost money to the department. Um, but our hope is that that wouldn't impact on the strategic direction of the, of the, of the programme as a whole um, and on the strategy that we intend to bring forward, because the business case will be bidding for the additional finances required um, for that. And in reduction, uh, as the EU Commission has done in the past number of years due to lack of progress on, on both Northern Ireland and the UK programme as a whole, the department has always covered uh, any measures for the programme that was needed, as it's a statutory obligation. So at this moment in time, I uh, don't see um, a massive or major impact on, on the strategic direction. Uh, the, the strategy as a whole will require significant funding, and I'll be subject to DOF advice, and an initial bid will need to be put for that uh, in due course once the Minister makes his final decisions on a way forward. Thank you, Neil. And Neil, the, the other thing I want to ask for, because in, in the previous DARD committee, when I was on it, um, it was during the tenure of the, the TVR, indeed, myself and other members of the committee, including uh, Ian Mullen and Oliver Mullen and, and Tom Elliott and others, we, we, we went on site in, out in County Down to, to see it in action. Uh, now, my understanding is that, uh, that that report, yes, it, it has been published, but there hasn't been uh, like a, a, full, a full analysis carried out of that as yet. Uh, is that the case? And if that is the case, well, why, why have we not seen that full analysis of it as yet? Of, of it as yet? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to bring Raymond in on, on this in a, in a second. But um, the TBR report, it's not one overarching report uh, as opposed to that. It's actually a number of reports uh, coming off the, the research that has been done in that, in that project over the five years. Um, and much of that has been published to date. Uh, and there are initial findings from that uh, dependent on the, on the research project taken forward from, from, those anal from that analysis and results. Um, I'll bring Raymond in on this. Um, he, he's more aware of this than, than I would be in terms of the technical detail. But Raymond, if you don't mind. Out. We can't hear you, Raymond. Can hear you, Raymond. Chair, if Raymond can't come in, Michael, Michael should be able to come in. Michael, can you hear? Can you hear me now? There we go. Is, is that Raymond? Yeah, you can Raymond. Yes. Hello, yes. Uh, sorry about that. The internet signal is, is not great here. Um, I think the question was, uh, what has TVR told us about uh, what we might do as far as controlling TB is concerned? 
Yes. Um, Neil, Neil was just saying there there will be no single report as such. However, uh, a number of reports have already uh, been published and there are more under development. I think the first point to make is that the TVR project was primarily an ecological project and it was to allow us to uh, develop techniques for capturing badgers in a humane way and uh, try and lay out a, a new, a relatively new blood test to assess them in the field. Uh, I can go on if you like to say that they, there's been a number of reports that have already been produced and they have given us a bit of an insight into, uh, well, for, for instance, the proportion of time cattle spend grazing in fields where there are sets, uh, the likelihood of badgers and cattle to come into direct contact with each other, whether or not the TVR project itself affected the way badgers uh, behaved. Did it make them range further or did it make them range less than would normally have been the case? And it also let us uh, have a little look at the genome sequencing, that is the, the genetic fingerprint of the TB isolates that we gathered from that area uh, to see what their history was and whether they're likely to have arisen locally or from uh, animals moving into the area. I hope that's helpful. Okay. And do you see the? No, I'll move around the room. Not hog at all. Uh, William. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, current levels of TB in Northern Ireland. We, we've been. I'm a farmer myself, so I'm fully aware of TB. Uh, and I have had instances of my own herd and learning interest. Um, in relation to the levels in the Republic of Ireland and the levels in Northern Ireland, the two jurisdictions are similar. What is it? What's the difference in the current levels of TB in both? Do you want me to take that again, Neil? Happy to, Raymond Chip. Thank you. <coughs> yeah. Uh, good morning, William. Uh, the current level in Northern Ireland is about 8.3%. It was a couple of years ago up, just nudging under 10%. Uh, it has come down significantly since then, uh, although obviously the COVID effect last year uh, where testing was suspended hasn't fully worked through yet. So it's, <clears throat> it's impossible to say at this stage whether we lost any ground as a result of that. In contrast, the figure in the Irish Republic at the minute is 4.3%, so significantly lower than here, although it is going in, in the opposite direction and that it has risen significantly in the last year or two. Have you any reason for why it's half what we are? Well, the, the, the two schemes are not equivalent. There are a number of differences between the schemes. There are differences in how farmers are compensated, differences how, in how the TB testing is paid for, and differences in the approach to wildlife intervention. And there has been a wildlife intervention program in place in the Irish Republic now for several decades. Uh, they are now at the stage where they're able to move to a vaccination-only policy in, in some areas and suspend, call, suspend or permanently stop calling in those areas, hopefully. So uh, the short answer is no. It's hard to say because the schemes are not equivalent, uh, but there is certainly a significant difference. But it, it, and it, it, it does look like calling... I know they were they called some badgers on it, even deer. It looks like that has been a benefit to them in the Republic, yeah. Well, that is certainly a significant difference between the two schemes. As I, I just would like to emphasise that it is not the only difference, but it certainly is a significant difference. And Raymond, I'll come in as well. You know, and, and William should be aware. You know, a lot of the uh, recommendations that were made to the department and that we previously consulted upon um, are, you know, addressing the diff differences in the schemes. You know, Ireland have made great progress uh, in terms of their TB rates. And as, as Raymond has outlined, there's no one particular factor uh, to outline why it is a lot lower than ours currently. But it is a suite of the measures that they have as part and parcel of their program including your testing regime, the compensation aspects, uh, the wildlife intervention aspect, to where you can point to why they are successful. And these are all the things that are under consideration uh, by us at the moment, and that will hopefully depend on the Minister's final views, will be part and parcel of a new TB eradication strategy for Northern Ireland. In, re in relation to testing, I'm aware that in England and the mainland, the UK, they use lay testers to help local vets test. Uh, has that been looked at in Northern Ireland, or would that reduce the cost, overall cost of testing? Seamus, do you want to come in there? Good morning, committee. Good morning, um, Seamus. Good morning. Uh, in relation to that, um, the issue of lay testers, I mean, our testing programme, and Michael and, and uh, Raymond are probably better placed to talk the actual programme itself, 
but primarily that's delivered through our private veterinary practitioners uh, who carry out the testing on our behalf under contract, uh, which has been quite successful year on year. Um, I think uh, in last year, 2020, 97.3% um, of our tests were completed which shows you the kind of the high success rate despite all the problems we've had uh, in relation to COVID restrictions. Um, in terms of lay testers, uh, it's not something we have uh, decided to go down at this point in time, um, but certainly it may be a consideration. Do, One of the do you want me to maybe, maybe pick up on that, Seamus? Yes, Raymond, if you could, yeah, maybe. Yeah, uh, lay testing is, uh, you're quite right, it is practiced in, in GB. We have piloted here, and indeed we have trained in the past a number of lay testers. It hasn't been introduced yet, nor has it been ruled out. There are issues with it, and, and one of the major issues is the certification issue. Uh, as you know, Northern Ireland PLC relies heavily on exports, and export certification requirements uh, do in some cases require um, a veterinary certification, and, and that in turn uh, is supported by a veterinary TB test report. So there are impediments to introducing it, but uh, as I understand, it's still under consideration. Okay, that's okay. Thank uh, you. Just on the back of what William said there, see, uh, again, a, a question for information. The, you mentioned that in the, the north of Ireland, the the, her the, the incident rate in herd is 8.3%, but I understand that in actual animals it's not 0.7%. What would be the equivalent uh, in the south, would you know off the top of your head, um, uh, in terms of actual animals as opposed to herds? I don't have that figure to hand, but we could provide it to the committee. Right, okay, thank you. Okay, I'm going to move swiftly around. Morris? Morris? Morris, can you hear us? Okay, we'll, we'll come back to Morris Harry. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much, Chair. And thank you, gentlemen. On false negatives, I'm just wondering um, how common are these in relation to the skin test? And would an, an alternative form of testing reduce the propensity for false negatives? I'll bring Raymond in here too again, Morris. Good morning uh, on, the, on that test question. Technical elements, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, yes, there, with any test, there are limitations. Uh, you can have test uh, false positives and you can have false negatives. Uh, false negatives uh, are much more likely than false positives. Uh, the test is a field test. Uh, unlike a lot of other diagnostic tests, you actually uh, inject the substance into the animal and in effect the animal tests the substance and, and you return several days later to see what that reaction has been. So there are uh, significant problems with the sensitivity of the test or significant issues with it. Uh, the specificity of the test, in other words, the likelihood of it giving a positive reaction uh, from an animal that doesn't have TB is very, very low. There's sometimes a little bit of confusion here in that there is a post-mortem examination carried out on reactor animals. It's carried out in the abattoir, but it's carried out primarily for public health purposes and not for test confirmation purposes. Uh, and it is easy to understand why farmers uh, who are told that nothing was observed in the carcass believe that that in turn means that the animal was not infected. But, but that's a misunderstanding which uh, we're working to uh, you know, we're working on our, our nomenclature that we use to try to explain these things a little bit better. I think the other part of the question related to other test types, and uh, there are indeed other test options. Uh, there is a gamma interferon test, uh, which we are already using on a voluntary basis. Uh, and one of the proposals in the new TB strategy is that we would make that a compulsory test. The gamma interferon test uh, without becoming too technical, it looks for a little protein that is produced uh, in response to infection. And we find that that test in parallel with the skin test works very well. Mm -hmm. There are then a number of what are called ELISA tests, either in use or under development. And the best immun immunological advice from the lab at present is that the use of those tests in addition to the gamma test and the skin test would not improve the overall accuracy of the test. So although we're keeping a watching brief there, we haven't found anything as yet that would improve the position. Uh, and finally, there is a, a test that has been observed or has been commented on quite a bit in the press called the Actophage test, which is an entirely different type of test. 
it claims to be able to detect uh, live bacteria in a number of different substrates, such as, you know, milk or blood or or animal dung, and claims to be able to detect at very low levels. However, the trials to date have been very small scale and the results have been equivocal. So again, we're keeping a watching brief on that, but there's nothing coming out of it yet that would indicate that it's something we should be pursuing. Okay, thank you. And just yeah. one other, Chair, oh, is that on. okay? On the eradication strategy, which I mean, yes, it is good, but with the problems at the minute, we'd focused on intense interver intervention in the short term, um, maybe be better up, up on a wee bit? It, it depends on, on final views of the Minister and, and obviously what, what the Department can deliver within the time period av available. Um, as you will be aware, for wildlife intervention, should the Minister decide to go down a particular route, it uh, will most likely require uh, secondary legislation uh, and obviously then securing of the money as well. And operationally dependent on, on a type of intervention that the Minister may choose to do, uh, training staff and, and getting prepared for that. So there's a lot of factors to take into account uh, in advance of whether or not we could decide to go for an intensive uh, wildlife intervention uh, on that point, I think that was your point. Um, so it's not unknown at the minute, but obviously once the minister makes decisions and then we start to plan forward uh, on the basis of that policy decision and, and from further consultation, which is also, also required, uh, then we'll be able to have a decision to, to, to decide that or to look at that further. Okay, thank you. Thanks, yeah, Chair. Um, John? John? Uh, Rosemary? Yeah, thank you. Now, yeah. Oh, sorry, John, 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 sorry, Rosemary. John, go ahead. Uh, some of the uh, issues, including the, the loss of the EU funding, have been covered already. Can I ask, um, in relation to the, 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 the wildlife, uh, is, is there engagement on an ongoing basis between the department officials and those who work in the wildlife sector? And are, are they included in any consultations taking place towards the, the new policy? So um, thanks, thanks very much for the question, John. Um, so there has been very good engagement with, with the wildlife sector um, over the previous consultation, and, and we met with them, including when I was in a different role within the TB team uh, at that time. Uh, there is informal engagement ongoing, uh, as and when required, and also, uh, as far as I'm aware, Seamus can correct me on this, but TBIP have met with a number of our key stakeholders as well, and the role as the independent advisory body to the department. Um, John, in terms of wildlife intervention, you know, it's quite clear if the minister does decide uh, on, that, on that and the, and the policy proposals that we put towards him, um, we require a consultation on that uh, on any particular wildlife intervention chosen and from that there will be an extensive stakeholder campaign uh, both from the department and officials uh, to engage with our, our key contacts within those organizations so there will be a full consultation on that and they'll be fully engaged on, on the proposal once decided thank you okay john rosemary thank you thank you and um, thank you for the presentation um my question is in relation to the potential moving of young calves on a farm especially a dairy farm where there's been, say, with three or four hundred dairy cows, and some some of them come down as re, as a reactor, and you have your calves. You know, you can't you can't move any animals off the farm. The calves are born, and that's adding an extra burden to the farm. And actually, maybe perhaps if one looked closely at it, maybe a welfare issue with all these extra calves on the farm that can't be removed sold off because generally dairy farmers sell their calves off within a few few weeks. Now, the, there's a very small incidence of TB in calves under six weeks. And I understand, you know, there was about 11 out of 44,000 last year, something like that. Is there potential, is there potential here for those, those dairy farmers who have a reactor to perhaps uh, sell off their calves either online or to uh, another farmer. Um, thanks so much. We're going to bring Michael or Raymond here as, as program managers on that one. Do you want me to take that one again, Michael? Or? Well, well, I'm 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 happy to go ahead. So, so yeah, the the, the rules are fairly strict for the entire herd. Um, whenever there's a breakdown, so all, all animals within the uh, within the herd are restricted. Um, including calves. Um, I mean, the reason that, that calves tend not to be infected or are uh, test positive is because they are young and TB is a very slow moving disease. So very often it's the older animals and the cows that are infected, but nevertheless, they are vulnerable uh, to TB as, as they grow older. 
and the, the legal framework that we work under um, requires the entire herd um, to be restricted. And really there's, there's, there's little or no leeway for movements of animals to other herds because it's posing a risk you know, to other herds. So that's why the, the, um, you know, the statu statutory position is so clear here. Um, uh, I hope that answers your question. Uh, yes, it, it does answer my question, but is there not, would there not need to be some thought given to these young calves are not, uh, not susceptible to TB at such a young age, and it would perhaps be another way of trying to support the farmer. He already can't get rid of cattle, at least if he could get, a, get rid of his young calves. Is there not some grounds for looking at that? Well, if I come in maybe there, uh, in the the scheme as it exists at present, there are provisions for calves to be moved off infected herds under exceptional circumstances. And indeed, one of the exceptional circumstances is where there is an animal welfare problem that can't be solved in any other way. It does require agreement uh, from the purchaser uh, to take the animals onto their farm. As, as Michael has pointed out, calves are susceptible to disease. Unfortunately, we do have outbreaks where uh, calves are heavily infected uh, when examined at post-mortem, uh, although it's fair to say that the incidence of disease is higher uh, in older animals. So there is that provision in, in exceptional circumstances. It's something the local offices are very well aware of. They do fully appreciate both the animal welfare issues and also the human welfare issues. It is it's stressful for farmers trying to manage a herd uh, with an accommodation that isn't suitable for it. Uh, there was another proposal from the department several years ago, and that was to set up alternative control herd arrangements where herds would be licensed to accept animals in from reactor herds. Now, there has been no uptake uh, to that as yet. The rules are pretty stringent, and obviously the purpose of those rules is to protect the neighbours of potential alternative control herds. So that's something we're still looking at, still uh, working through how we might uh, make that scheme more practicable for farmers who are interested in taking it up. Uh, but just to recap, there are arrangements in, in place at present uh, where exceptional circumstances apply. Sure, uh, Seamus Murray here, if you may add to that. Uh, going back to the eradication strategy in development, uh, one of the proposals within that is for industry, TBEP and department officials to uh, review uh, alternative control hours and uh, to consider the current uh, criteria around that uh, to see how we can either adjust, improve or amend that and to make it more, I suppose, um, attractive or amenable uh, to the needs of the farmer. Uh, so that's one of the proposals contained within the eradication strategy itself. Okay. And ju just to clarify, um, Chair, that's, that's animals of all ages within the herd. It's not just cows. OK, thank you. Uh, Patsy? Oh, Lane. Patsy, yeah, yeah. Thanks, very much, thanks very much to, to all of you, the, the officials presenting. I just want to go back there to uh, the implications of the spread of the disease by uh, badgers. And I know you referred to, there's been some notional uh, reference there to, to uh, research carried out in, in other jurisdictions and indeed uh, down south around this particular issue. Yes, badgers is one thing, but uh, I don't know whether you're aware, you probably are, you're at the department of the uh, quite prolific growth in the deer population. And as you will also be aware, deers can travel an awful lot further than what uh, badgers can. And I do know from, from wearing another hat that um, the, uh, I'm not sure of the level of prevalence in deer, but certainly deer, as Seamus will know there, can, can catch TB and can spread TB. And uh, one farmer that I do know uh, would attribute the, the contamination of his hair directly to that. So two questions. One is specifically around what the department feels the view of the spread of the disease via um, badgers is and how that can be curtailed and what options have been considered or are likely to be considered for the curtailment of that. And um, the second one is then what level of knowledge, information and um, research has been done as to the spread of TB via the, the wild deer population. 
Thanks very much, Patsy. Um, I'll take the first question just around Badger intervention, uh, potentially on options, um, and then if I ask Raymond or Michael to come in uh, on deer and cattle as, as well, um, if you don't mind. Um, in terms of um, wildlife intervention, Patsy, as, as you're aware, you know the TBSBG had, had outlined that you know only a holistic approach. Uh, addressing all the, the spread of disease would, would work. Um, and the department accepted that uh, and said, you know, they could see merit in what they had proposed, which was for a proactive call, um, subject to the views of a minister. Uh, minister has, has been on record to say he agrees with that approach that, you know, all vectors need to be addressed. And as a result from that, we have then been looking to develop the final options for him uh, in terms of what wildlife intervention would look like uh, and how then we would take it forward. Um, and that's, that involves looking at other jurisdictions. It looks involving at TBR and the experiences we've learned. And so there are a suite of options under consideration, both in terms of the business case and finalised advice, or advice that is being finalised, I should say, and the Minister then will decide on a way forward. There are obviously a lot of factors to take into consideration, not least the consultation, which we'll have to do on that, and stakeholder views, but also value from money perspectives as well, and what the business case shows, and also non-monetary benefits too. So the department is looking at a wide range of things around that, uh, and the minister has, you know, already outlined that he is intending to address that, um, and that will be subject to his final views, hopefully, very, very shortly as we continue and progress that. In terms of TB uh, in deer, we, we recognise that absolutely, and Rim will come in in a second, and we recognise it to such an extent that within the strategy, one of the recommendations that we we, are, we was proposed to us and that we've been analysing and final advice to the minister is to bring in additional legislation to give us the power to test those animals, um, because at the moment we can only test animals if, if cattle on or on site on the holding so that's one of the things that we're very much aware of um, and we've done research into as well as far as i'm aware uh, when, I, when i was aware from the role and um, but i'll let raymond or michael come in and, and comment then on that particular point patsy if i could just intervene there um i know the deer population has become so extensive in scotland that they really have a major problem with it in parts of of scotland so uh, i would maybe ask if i could sorry for interrupting there um, no if there is any experience that you can learn from scotland around that particular matter relating to the wild deer population. I'll, I'll ask Michael or Raymond to come in here, but just to, you know, we, we do obviously look at our, um, you know, our colleagues across the water and, and down south as well on all these aspects of the TB programme and continually learn uh, in terms of what they're doing on their approach. But I'll ask Michael or Raymond to come in on that particular point as well, uh, Patsy. Well, I'm, I'm, happy for, I'm happy for Raymond to detail it, but the, the Scotland actually, interestingly, is has got very, very low levels of bovine TB. But Raymond, could you come in and just outline um, the situation with the deer. Yeah, uh, I do not hog the meeting, but unfortunately, this does look like one for me again. Um, the first, there's a number of points there. Uh, the first point is deer do indeed become infected with bovine TB, and there is evidence that they spread it on to cattle. In fact, uh, nearly all wild animal species become infected with TB. It, the issue is whether they're a dead end host uh, or, or whether they can, in fact, spread it back to domestic animals. Uh, as Neil mentioned there, we are uh, intending to introduce legislation to allow the testing, but just to clarify, that will be the testing of farm deer uh, rather than wild deer. The point about research was mentioned as well. We uh, sponsor uh, a number of research projects through AFPE and others, and one of the projects currently underway is looking at the the distribution of the various deer species within Northern Ireland and also the distribution of TB lesions within those deer species. There's certainly, uh, I'm not sure whether this is maybe where the question is coming from, but there's certainly quite a bit of concern amongst the farming community in the west of the province about the role that deer may be playing and, and we're very aware of that and that is one of the, one of the purposes of the project. Uh, down south, there has been a lot of interest in the deer problem, in particular in the Wicklow area. There's an established uh, cattle deer issue, uh, which they have been grappling with now for a number of years. And we are able to participate in, in various seminars and forums that DAFM have set up to look at, at developments in, in this area. So yes, it's, some, it's something we're very aware of. We do accept that the animals become infected and can be a source of infection to cattle. It's difficult at the moment just to quantify the extent of that. Certainly our own epidemiological investigation of TB breakdowns in Northern Ireland Ireland is that perhaps three to four percent of all breakdowns uh, are attributed to deer. So while it's significant and while it's concerning for the farmers involved, it may not be a major issue preventing eradication here. Could I just come back on that there? The, the, uh, the farm deer issue is probably, farm deer are a very minuscule amount uh, in terms of the actual population, deer population. And uh, there's one farmer that I know found out that uh, farm deer, whenever he went to approach what he perceived to be the, 
the owner of a deer that had just raked through his cabbage field. Um, he was told by that perceived owner that this is a wild animal you've got there. So um, I'm just wondering how you, how you discern, uh, because these, these guys, the deer can go, as you, you'll know, you know much better than me, they can travel wild distances and uh, jumping a fence is not a problem to them. Uh, so uh, I'm wondering just what, what is the purpose of farm deer, uh, of testing farm deer and uh, the legislative agreement that that gives you as opposed to the ability to test other animals that are roaming freely and indeed they could be uh, farm deer as, as some of these are that just jump a fence and head away and then of course they become a wild deer. It's, it's probably it maybe useful to clarify that the legislation we're talking about would give us the uh, ability to test farm deer. It wouldn't be that we'd been having to introduce a routine testing program for farm deer. But on occasions, we do have farms uh, perhaps contiguous to a severe cattle breakdown where there are only non bovine species and we're not able to do uh, testing on those farms. So, so, so it'll be a useful power, but it'll not be something that'll be uh, applied more widely. Uh, the, the feral deer uh, issue is a significant issue. Uh, as, as you've rightly pointed out, it is very difficult to keep feral deer off your property. Um, no, I'm just taking this a stage further. There are people who, who are right there, indeed some of them are employed by the department uh, to maintain uh, deer population levels. Um, is, there, is there any way that those people, some of them are are well well skilled in the, the word of Grallachan and things like that and, and know what signs to watch out for. Is there any methodology that perhaps you could work with some of the organization needs indeed your own people uh, to ensure that when an animal is killed or found dead or, or hit by a vehicle um, and maybe uh, that, that animal would have been killed and somebody has found elements of TB well in the tongue or lesions maybe in lungs or wherever else they might be um, that there is a methodology there of working to ensure that that's reported back because that would be a red flag for any uh, any other animals in the area and any other herds that uh, farmers might have in proximity to that that animal relative proximity I should say given it's a deer. Yeah, absolutely. That AFPE project that I referred to, uh, the material for that project is provided entirely by the deer hunting community and we're very grateful for their their uh, participation in that. There's also a legislative requirement uh, for any lesions uh, of suspect TB to be reported and that includes suspect TB in, in wild deer that are shot. And again, the, the hunting community is relatively uh, coherent community or, uh, and, and we do have good contacts through their organizations uh, All right. and, well, and we're here. appreciative appreciative of their support in this. Okay, thanks very much indeed, Chair. Thank you. No problem. Uh, Morris, uh, you're back online there. You dipped out a wee bit there, Morris. Do you want to come in there? Yeah, can you hear me, Chair? Yes, Morris, we can now, yes. Yeah, uh, Chair, uh, just to pick up on a point, uh, actually, that rose my head had raised, uh, regarding the sale of calves, um, I, I believe there are markets in England who, and also recently trial in Wales, I believe, that allow uh, approved dedi uh, dedicated sales of TB restricted cattle uh, under licence, of course, uh, but not to other herds direct to the slaughter. Uh, could they, anybody give me any, any indication that is that the case? Yeah, I'll I'll take that more. Yes, yes, that is the case. Um, and in, in Wales, referred to as as orange marts, um, but they're in a very different situation from us as. as we sort of outlined there um, the, the alternative control herds, whereby you can allow that move into a 100% housed unit uh, to protect obviously your your, your neighbours and so forth. And from so you'd move in from a TB restricted herd. Um, that hasn't been taken up in Northern Ireland as yet. And one of the key proposals is for us to work with industry and for TBEP to engage on that to understand why and to see what the parameters could be uh, to get more of those established. Um, in England, there are over I think about 200 or 300 of them, and in Wales, um, I think there are nine or ten uh, on that at the moment. So therefore, that mart provides that form where the those SEHs then, you know, can then receive their stock and be sold through that mart. At the moment in Northern Ireland, it wouldn't make much sense because we don't have any kind of sort of control herds to sell into, and then where those those cattle can go. So that that's the difference. Uh, but it's something that, of course, we would consider and could consider uh, post actually getting SEHs in operation, depending on the outcome of, of that review as part of the strategy. Yeah, well, thank you very much for that. I just wondered, but perhaps since you are, are looking into it, you could uh, keep the, the committee updated and any progress. 
Yeah, uh, ab absolutely, Morris. It's not not we're not, we're not looking into the marts at the moment. Um, we're looking obviously at the alternative control herds as a whole, which would you know where the cattle would go after following through the mart instead of direct slaughter. So therefore, we need to get the alternative control herds up and running in Northern Ireland if we were to ever have a mart. So the mart would come after that. So there's no work being done on the mart at the moment. The first stage is actually see if alternative control herds are something that could be established in Northern Ireland or what industry feel or be the restrictions to that. Uh, obviously, taking into account new disease spread is, is the primary concern uh, for the department. But that's 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 really that'll be part of the strategy, and as you, you'll see. Okay. Well, thanks very much for that. Thank you, Chair. Hey, Morris. Uh, Claire. Claire. Yeah, thanks, Chair, um, and thanks for the, the briefing so far. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any more detail on the the introduction of the compensation cap for farmers. Um, th thanks very much, Claire. So, uh, as you're aware, TBSBG had recommended a cap of £1,500 and then £1,800 for, for pedigree cattle. Um, and from that, then we developed proposals uh, and put out a consultation saying we were minded to potentially progress down that route, along with another, of com another number of compensation measures. Um, but that was uh, predicated on the fact that a minister would need to take a decision on that. Since that point, we have been developing final proposals for the minister to, to look at and to approve, and that will be subject to his approval in terms of what way he wants to take that forward. We're cognizant of the fact that you know, Northern Ireland is the only part of these islands, both the UK and Ireland, that don't have any um, compensation cap or regime in place. Um, there's a £5,000 cap in Scotland and Wales, and Scotland give a bit more for pedigrees, and England um, go by table valuations. So we're really the only part of the, the, the UK that have um, an unlimited, technically 100% value compensation. And this was a criticism, both of the Northern Ireland Office report, the, the European Commission and, and the Public Accounts Committee in 2009. So those, um, those proposals are being looked at, um, and again, it will be for a minister to take final decisions on. And, also, with that clarity outline, that will require secondary legislation too. Um, so that will be consulted upon, uh, and industry will be engaged on that, uh, or stakeholders as well too. Thank you. And you mentioned the Northern Ireland Audit Report there as well. Um, and that audit report uh, in, back in 2018 um, identified um, that we weren't doing very good. You know that, that all our measures, um, our previous efforts, have resulted in the failure really to reduce um, disease levels. So I'm wondering from there, really, do, and I know that the, the TB Strategic Partnership Group as well, and a lot of recent studies, and one in particular that I've been looking at as well, have shown that badger calls in particular um, risk the increase in spreading the disease, because once you start calling them, badgers will start moving further afield and therefore spreading the virus, and linked into what Patsy was saying with the deer as well, you know, they're, they roam far and wide. Um, and I'm putting in the context of COVID and how we're dealing with that. And you know, yeah. with the virus about to control that, you know, we're trying to get people to stay still, stay home, you know, uh, rather than move about and, and spread it. Um, so I'm just wondering. I know that you've already mentioned that you consulted widely with the um, environmental stakeholders and the wildlife sector as well. So I know that there's a lot of science out there, and it can be a wee bit dubious in places. But are you confident that the appropriate science is being relied on currently? So, uh, Claire, I'll, I'll, there's one point, there's a couple of points there, so I'll, I'll address the first one or two, and then I'll bring in uh, Raymond or Michael, and, and I think what you're referring to is the perturbation issue, um, and, and we do have you know, a number of views on that, and a number of results coming from the TBR project. Michael and Raymond would be better placed to dis discuss that with you. In terms of the Northern Ireland Office report, yes, it was indicating that we weren't doing terribly well, but just to note that one of their key recommendations from that report was to implement the TBSPG recommendations in full. Um, one of the key aspects they were saying was there isn't a holistic approach in Northern Ireland, you're not addressing all of the factors, which include wildlife intervention, which include compensation, which include the testing regime, and very much off the back of that as well. That is why in 2018, when we consulted um, on the proposed way forward, that, and that was the time that we had the, the engagement always of the other stakeholders, including environmental uh, NGOs too, um, we indicated that we would be in, intending possibly to move forward with all of those, all of the aspects addressing them all, subject to Minister's views on certainly compensation and wildlife intervention, which we're now obviously considering and, and doing. In terms of the, um, in terms of the wildlife intervention and the potential then for badgers then to spread out from that. Again, I think that that is the perturbation issue. And, and Raymond or Michael, I don't know if you want to come in, either one of you, on, on that particular. Yeah, Neil, um, uh, yes, that is, I think, what has been referred to is, is the, the perturbation of uh, badgers once you start removing badgers from the population. And for instance, if you remove uh, a dominant female from a clan, then that uh, obviously affects the behaviour of the rest of the clan. The perturbation effect was, or perturbation, and, and in turn a perturbation effect, that is to say uh, an effect on cattle, TB incidence in the area, was observed in GB. It has not been reported uh, from the ROI. Uh, 
and one of the specific findings from our TVR project was that there was no sign of it there either. Uh, we don't know why there would be a difference, but there certainly is uh, a difference in the behaviour between badgers in, in GB and badgers on the island of Ireland. Generally speaking, uh, the social group size, or sometimes referred to as clan size, of GB badgers is considerably bigger than that observed here, so that it may have something to do with that. But perturbation has not been observed here, and, and, and we don't believe it's an issue. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Claire. Um, and just before we finish up here, um, I just want to just get, get, get a wee indication from you is, um, in terms of the, the timeline. Um, now, the, the strategic outline case was approved in 2017. The Department of Finance and the, yourselves, um, DERA, is working with federal officials on the outline business case, What uh, which will then have to go for a final business case approval by Department of Finance. What, what's the timeline like for, for getting that um, outline business case um, complete it and get it to the Department of Finance and, uh, and, and to move this on to the next stage. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, we're hoping imminently in the next you know, number of months, very shortly. And the, the Minister is very, uh, very firm on this. Um, he, he wants to move on as soon as possible, and that's what we're aiming to do. Um, the business case uh, is just very complicated. It's a very difficult business case. It's uh, over 30 years and one of the most technically complicated, I think, many of us have seen in quite a long time. Um, and, and that has been part of why it has been delayed, uh, to, to, to be frank. Um, so we're moving at pace on that. Uh, and following that business case development being completed, we'll be able to give the Minister you know, final options for what he can consider way forward and then launch a consultation. But certainly it's within the next number of months. Uh, I don't want to stick to strict time scales in, in case there are any outside factors that that, that, that didn't happen. But uh, it's a main priority for us and the team. It's a main priority for us in the division. It's a main priority for the minister. So we're working on it very, very much at pace. So, so you, you're working on an outline business case and inside the next number of months it'll move to a public consultation? Should the minister decide on his preferred way forward, uh, and those requirements decide that we need a public consultation again, that's that's subject to his final views. Uh, and see, just finally, finally, um, again, uh, raised during the last uh, briefing as well, the, the the issue of divergence. I note that there has been some progress been made on the cattle vaccine. Uh, what implication will that have for for here? You know, uh, if a cattle vaccine is approved across the water in Britain. But it's, it's, it's obviously not something that's um, um, approved within the EU. <laughs> That, that is an issue of divergence, Chair, um, and, and as you're aware, you, you know, under the Northern Protocol, we are required to align ourselves with another our pieces of legislation, not least um, much of animal health and welfare. Um, and the animal health law that will come into effect in April you know, will, will then form the basis for a lot of our programme measures, or statutory obliged uh, programme measures. Um, should GB diverge and, and, and use uh, the vaccine, that, that's a decision for them to take. Um, they'll have to take into account, obviously, the trade implications of that, um, and that'll be something they'll need to look at further. Uh, and there are you know, the common frameworks, as I was with you before in November, discussing have been set up to demand that divergence and discuss the implications uh, for both of us, uh, both Northern Ireland and GB, should that be an issue. Um, but for us, you know, we will have to continue to um, adhere to the programme requirements as required under EU legislation. Um, so therefore, at the moment, it wouldn't, be a, it wouldn't be a possibility for us. But in time, you know, who knows? It, it, it depends on the, the legislative uh, picture in the coming years. OK. Um, I'll, I'll not ask you to try and foresee or forecast any trade implications because uh, <laughs> it would be probably uh, very difficult, I'm sure, and challenging this time. Would that be right, or would you, could you foresee any difficulties? Um, no, for, for, for Northern Ireland, I couldn't say. I, you know, as long as we you know, adhere to our programme measures, and it depends on what third countries dealing with GB would want in terms of a cattle vaccine, I can't comment on that. Um, but my primary concern is obviously the Northern Ireland programme uh, and making sure that our industry is protected and our trade is protected and we're adhering to the legislation as, as outlined and as required under, under the EU regulation and soon to be the animal health law um, to protect that. That's good. Well, I'd like to take the opportunity to, to thank you very much, uh, Raymond, Seamus, Neil and Michael, um, for your detailed briefing and for answering all of our questions. And hopefully we'll be seeing you soon in the next uh, number of months or weeks. Okay. Thank you, now. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Thank you, members. Take care, now. Bye. Uh, OK, members, we're moving on to item seven on the agenda. We're going to have an oral briefing uh, on the Common Framework Resources and Waste Policy. The memo from the clerk is at page 8083 of your pack and the papers from the Department 84 to 91. I'd like to welcome Mike Starleaf and uh, now John Mills, Head of Environmental uh, Policy Branch, Janice Harris, 
Environmental Policy Branch, page 6, Robert McLaughlin, Deputy Principal, Environmental Policy Branch. And I'd like to invite the officials to brief the committee and then members will ask uh, some questions thereafter. So, do you want to just kick off there? Okay. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, good morning, Chair. I uh, hope uh, you and committee members can hear me okay. Yeah. Um, the, the purpose of this briefing, as you said, is to provide information on, on the progress made by the UK government and uh, devolved administrations in developing a UK-wide common framework for resources and waste. Uh, this is one of 15 uh, frameworks across DERA, uh, 10 on the environment side. Uh, the draft provisional framework and Concordat are currently going through internal clearance as part of what's called uh, phase three and will be sent to the committee for consideration during the, the next phase, phase uh, four. In the interim, uh, we've provided the, the committee with a summary paper on, on the framework, uh, which I think the committee received uh, last week. Uh, turning to the uh, reasons for... John, you're cutting out there. The framework uh, of frameworks. Sorry, Jeff. You're sure you're intermittent, John. You're cutting out. Okay. Um, that's not. My system isn't telling me that. Yeah, well, we're, we're, we're here. here. You okay now, John? To our... Okay. Yeah, we're here. Um, I'll try again. Yeah. Um, EU, EU law provides um, the legal framework uh, across the UK until the end of the, uh, or provided the framework uh, across the UK for the, until the end of the transition period. And the frameworks are intended to set out arrangements for joint working from uh, the 1st of January this year. Uh, the Joint Ministerial Committee, uh, EN, on EU negotiations on the 16th, of October 2017 agreed a set of principles that would uh, determine the creation of common frameworks. And uh, uh, these principles have been included in the development of the uh, resource and waste common frameworks. Those principles are things like enabling the function of the UK internal market, uh, ensuring compliance with international obligations, uh, ensuring the UK can enter into trade negotiations, enabling the management of common resources, administering and providing access to justice in cases with a cross-border element, and safeguarding uh, security. The frameworks will respect the, the devolved settlements and the uh, accountability of devolved uh, legislatures. Frameworks will also uh, recognise the economic and social linkages between Northern Ireland and Ireland and recognise that Northern Ireland will be the only part of the UK that shares a land border with the EU. Uh, they will also adhere to the Belfast Agreement. So the resources uh, and waste is a policy area which the UK government um, uh, decided needed a common framework as part of its framework analysis. Uh, I'll go on to the scope of what's in the framework. It includes uh, producer responsibility, including things like packaging, batteries, uh, waste, electronic and electrical equipment, and other areas, uh, various technical standards, waste classifications, including hazardous waste, data reporting and monitoring, recycling, waste collection, circular economy, and other matters. So generally uh, uh, covering uh, things across the waste spectrum. Uh, Decision-making on uh, reserve matters, such as international uh, shipment of waste, will continue to sit with the UK government in line with the devolved settlement. However, uh, the UK government will involve devolved administrations as fully as possible in decision-making on uh, non-devolved matters which impact or, or have uh, importance uh, in a devolved area. <clears throat> The framework recognises that waste is a devolved area of competence and that each jurisdiction has its own strategies, waste management plans and waste prevention programmes and different approaches to recycling uh, and that the various uh, jurisdictions are entitled to follow their own paths on this. Uh, where uh, EU directives had previously set minimum targets, uh, different, different jurisdictions have had different standards and uh, this is again recognized <clears throat> against that um, 
some waste streams, notably uh, producer responsibility regimes, currently operate on a UK basis anyway and are unpinned, uh, underpinned by GB and equivalent Northern Ireland legislation or UK-wide uh, legislation. Uh, there's quite a few interdependencies uh, recognised by the frameworks on things like uh, waste from chemicals, water, um, marine, agriculture, and so on. Uh, it also recognises that uh, value chains and materials are traded as a, con uh, as a commodity on waste, and that there will be a need to provide for uh, joint working between the four governments to ensure that uh, the, the uh, regulatory agencies can work together on things like research and strategies and so on. In terms of the impact on stakeholders, the framework is about internal arrangements between UK administrations, so there's really no direct impact on stakeholders. On governance, the framework again deals with, uh, uh, we'll have, it'll have an associated Concord Act, and it'll deal with uh, establishing the method for working together through things like working groups, uh, inter-administrative uh, information sharing, stakeholder engagement, including arrangements for developing the UK position on reserve matters, and it'll set out principles and, and processes for decision making. And these will include things like regular meetings, uh, sharing of information, advanced notification of policy developments, which might impact on other jurisdictions, uh, consideration of new arrangements uh, to cover, for example, loss of access to advisory groups or research from the EU, and the avoidance of, uh, of, of policies in one uh, jurisdiction adversely affecting another. There'll also be a, a dispute uh, resolution uh, procedure largely based around the uh, in current interministerial group. Um, on future development, the framework does not uh, require legislation being a voluntary and non-statutory agreement. Um, EU legislation uh, already provides a, a, a legislative background in, in the area of waste anyway. Um, and, but it's, it's, these are, this is expected to, or anticipated to develop over time. So the uh, framework will also take account of uh, the fact that things could change. Uh, finally, moving on to the next steps, uh, the framework is currently provisional. Uh, the four uh, jurisdictions will continue to work together to develop the detailed proposals uh, for the resource and common waste common framework, taking into account any impacts from the recent trade and cooperation agreement between the UK and EU. Um, provisional agreement to the framework has been provided by ministers in the uh, four uh, jurisdictions and will be confirmed by uh, the Joint Ministerial Council in due course. Further development of the provisional framework, including scrutiny by the four legislatures uh, of the, uh, in the UK, and further engagement with stakeholders will be undertaken following that uh, uh, JMC sign-off. Uh, and following that, uh, the final framework will be agreed by uh, ministers in the four administrations. Um, so that's a, a quick coverage of the, of the framework agreement, and we're happy to uh, answer any uh, questions on that. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that, uh, John. Um, one of the things that you mentioned in your report and in the paper uh, is about it being um, the whole issue of waste, recognising the, the north, south and the land border issue. And for many of us who represent uh, consistency, particularly along the border and indeed throughout all of the island of Ireland, you know, the whole issue of cr the cross-border movement of waste is, 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 a, is, is an absolutely massive one. And I just want to, you know, I know we're looking at a, this is a common framework within the, the four, ju four jurisdictions, the north and Wales, Scotland and England. Uh, you know, what, what depth and scale of involvement have you had with your counterparts in the south of Ireland? You know, because this is a huge issue, particularly in border regions. Uh, on um, well, obviously the the, the main the main formal um, arrangements are through the uh, North South Ministerial Council and the British Irish Council, where uh, um, the environment is obviously one of the areas that covers. So waste is a a frequent uh, agenda item 
in those areas. There's a range of um, uh, um, uh, on the ground uh, operational cooperation between uh, various between the, the agencies, the, the environment agency and their opposite numbers and things like uh, waste crime and so on. Um, and the, um, the, the, the Northern Ireland Protocol has, has meant that um, the, um, as, as waste, um, waste shipments is one of the, the legislative items in the Northern Ireland Protocol that we will follow. Um, the arrangements that we currently have uh, as part of the EU will continue. So uh, there are all those um, reasons to uh, uh, for uh, the cooperation North South to to continue. Um, just on the question of, of uh, any agree any uh, negotiations we've had with uh, Southern uh, colleagues. Um, We've we've been um, uh, negotiating or having contact with the with the EU as a, as, a, as a whole. So uh, we haven't particularly engaged uh, at a policy level with um, with with Southern colleagues. That'd be so far, but I would expect that to change now that we've got the um, uh, the, the cooperation agreement in place. I don't know if there's anything to add to that, Janice. Just that um, the policy teams um, do keep in touch with colleagues in the South and collaborate and, and, and discuss as necessary, you know, in, in that sort of policy development forum as well. That's There's well-established relationships. Yeah, um, before we move around to the room then, so just want to just pick on this a little bit further. You mentioned there, John, a second ago that this framework is it's, it's effectively in draft form at the moment, but that the um, the different regions will be uh, developing it further. Um, will there be an involvement with the South in that develop, fleshing out that the strategy? Because I think high level involvement, okay, on the ground is absolutely very important, but I think a high level involvement is also very important <coughs> as well in the very unique circumstances we have on this island. Um. Well, there's no, um, there's, there's no, this is, this is, um, the, 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 this framework and all the frameworks really um, are about uh, inter, uh, the, the, the relationships between the jurisdictions within the UK. Uh, this is how I've certainly seen the ones I've involved, involved in. Um, so we, we had, we were, we were in the EU and the EU set the rules basically, and all the jurisdictions of the UK had to do the same thing anyway. And now we've lost that, um, or, or we've left that behind. Um, and the frameworks are to really replace that, that um, the, 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 the cooperation between, or to build the cooperation between the jurisdictions. So in, in, the, in this framework, I wouldn't see um, that there would be uh, and there hasn't been involvement of uh, Southern colleagues, but, but the framework itself uh, does say that, um, that it must, uh, that any, any future arrangements must take account of the, um, of, of the fact that, uh, uh, you know, we, 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 we live on the island of Ireland and, and uh, have, um, close relations with, with uh, the Southern counterparts. Um, but the, so that recognition of, of the point you make is there, but just as a, as, as a mechanism, this is really an inter-UK thing. Yeah, I just, I just want to re reiterate that, that, you know, I appreciate that, you know, Central UK, but you know, we do share a 300 mile land border with an EU member state and we're on the one island, which is a, an epidemiological unit, and I just think it'd be crucial at every level that that harmonisation is there for, for, for everybody's good. Uh, yeah, certainly, and um, on the the the, um, the the arrangements under the Northern Ireland Protocol will will uh, ensure that happens on things like waste movements, um, where we will continue to have the same arrangements. Um, as as the south, and 
those arrangements will possibly will be different from GB. Thank you, John. Uh, Rosemary? Yeah, thank you. Thank you again for your presentation there. Um, you mentioned the protocol briefly. Um, can you give me? Can you go into a wee bit more detail as to how the protocol would impact uh, and interact with the framework? Give me a little bit more detail on that. Um, okay. So the the um, the protocol um, identifies about well, it obviously it identifies any number of of. of um, things that where Northern Ireland will follow um, EU, uh, existing EU uh, rules and, and directives and regulations. And there's about five of them um, affect uh, the, the waste area, waste shipments, um, producer responsibility uh, arrangements on packaging, batteries, uh, waste electronic equipment, and um, one other. Ship recycling. Yes, thank you. Um, so, the the Northern Ireland Protocol um, will require um, our, us in Northern Ireland to, to follow uh, the what the EU does in those areas, and uh, the, the need to do that will probably have a, a, a knock on to sl slightly wider areas of waste, but in the other areas. Uh, where there isn't a requirement, um, we will be um, we we are following the um, what is retain what is called retained EU law, where which is the the, the the EU law that's been preserved. So the framework will cover um, cover all of that, um, but the protocol will mean that we have to uh, follow. Uh, EU rules in those areas I've mentioned, and that will override the framework because that's um, you know that's an international and domestic law requirement, and, and that'll override anything in in the framework which isn't law. Thank, thank you. And um, do you see any sort of financial implications in relation to that? No. No, we don't. Uh, we do not, don't anticipate any financial implications for this at all. It's purely um, an administrative arrangement between um, the four constituent nations. Okay. Okay, uh, Philip. Philip. Yep. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Uh, um, my questions uh, kind of falling on from uh, the two previously made uh, are, are particularly around governance uh, arrangements. I uh, mean, uh, as the chair and Rosemary uh, have pointed out, you know, we will have to abide by the, the Irish protocol uh, and also that we live uh, on an island. Uh, so, you know, with those particular uh, characteristics to deal with. So, I mean, I'm, I'm just concerned or I am actually concerned about the governance arrangements in terms of, of this protocol and devolved, uh, particularly this devolved uh, institution being allowed to develop policies specific to here that, you know, so uh, maybe a bit more detail in terms of how, who, how the priorities in terms of uh, the, the devolved institutions making laws with regard to this framework. And I mean, and then the other thing uh, in terms of the protocol, just but more detail in terms of the impact. If there's any kind of impact on north-south trade or even international trade with regard to this framework. Um, on the um, on, on on the question of devolution, first of all, the 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 framework goes out of its way to 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 um, to recognise that. Um, that that it can't override the 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 the, um, the the arrangements whereby we've we've our own uh, ability to take our own course on um, on areas uh, like um, uh, recycling or um, or, or um, uh, other areas uh, of of waste management. Um, 
so that's that's recognised, and as as it, as it's non-statutory, um, it can't override our um, ability to to uh, make our own laws, and uh, that's not trying to. Uh, what it's really trying to do is to um, uh, make sure there's. Uh, uh, exchange of information, that there's forewarning, uh, so that uh, there isn't adverse impacts uh, from if one jurisdiction follows a, a policy that might have an adverse impact on another. It's also quite helpful from our point of view in that there's, there's certain aspects, such as waste shipments of, on, of waste, which are reserved to the UK government. And it's really in the interest of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland to um, make sure that we're properly con consulted on those um but the um but, but it doesn't override our ability to adopt our own um our own policies and where the northern ireland protocol is concerned we will have to as a matter of uh, international and domestic law we will have to follow uh what the eu does uh and not what the uk does um so that can't override that um, in terms of uh, uh, the effect on trade, um, well, uh, well waste, sorry, I was, sorry just Justin, the, I was just going to say the guiding principles um, under which this has been established is to make sure that we don't have a negative impact on North, South or international trade. Okay. Uh, yep. Have enough of that, Philip, William? Oh, right. sorry, thank you. Okay, right, no problem. Uh, Claire? Thank you, Chair, um, and thanks for this. Um, I'm noting that the Department is saying that there is no immediate changes for stakeholders, um, and I'm wondering, do, you, do, do Department officials feel that there is no need for immediate change within the sector? Or Sorry, I, I didn't I didn't catch the end of just the end of that. Okay, I'm just wondering, um, given that you're stating that there's no immediate changes for stakeholders with this common framework, do you feel that that is right that there is no need for immediate change within the sector? Um, <clears throat> on 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 waste, I, I I have to say I think we we have um, a lot of already a lot of good relations across. Uh, of joint working, um, we already have various groups set up, so I, I, I don't see it as an as a problem area or, or an immediate problem area. But um, on stakeholders, um, I don't think a lot of this would be of great concern to stakeholders, to be honest. And we haven't had any feedback. Janice, did uh, Defra um, have gone out to stakeholders? Some yeah. Stakeholders. I, I, Yes, yeah, so it's been the frameworks have been mentioned in various stakeholder for, forums, and, and there has been um, no substantive um, feedback on the framework. It's it's just acknowledged that it's an, an internal um, to, to um, government working arrangements um, document rather than changing substantial policy areas. Okay, so yep, given that this is a voluntary agreement program uh, and it's not a legal or a legislative framework being compiled, I'm wondering then how does Northern Ireland compare with other UK regions and of course Ireland as well? Um, I'm thinking particularly with legislation. Um, so the legislative framework across the islands is very different, for example, with single use plastics legislation, illegal dumping, uh, maybe financial benefits cost to the sector and to businesses. So has a comparative study been done or will it be done in order to maybe provide a, a starting point for what this voluntary common framework will be? Uh, well, the, the, the framework does, uh, the, the, the actual body of the framework did have a uh, list all the various um, um, legislative areas of which there are many, as you correctly say, um, the on the um on, on the on divergence um there are a number of different approaches um and um uh, you know for example on on deposit and return where scotland's doing slightly different thing i mean we're already working together on on that um 
Equally, there are other areas where, um, as I've mentioned, producer responsibility, things like packaging, which are common across the UK. And that's, um, you know, that's, a, that's quite a, 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 an advantage and something that a lot of businesses which operate across the uh, across the borders um, would prefer to see maintained. Um, on on single-use plastics, um, because as part of the agreement on the implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, of about um, uh, 10th of December this year, preceding the overall agreement, um, part of that was um, a, a paper called uh, Emissions and Errors, and the single-use or aspects of the single-use plastics directive have, as a result of that, been adopted as part of the uh, Northern Ireland Protocol now. So it's a late, single-use plastics is a late addition to the Northern Ireland Protocol. So on that, there won't be divergence with the South because we'll be, um, we'll, we, we like them, will have to follow uh, EU requirements on that. Okay, so is current Northern Ireland legislation, um, particularly adherence to it, uh, including enforcement and moder monitoring, adequate really for us to move forward with a voluntary common framework? Um, I'm thinking in particular, could this um, allow UK government, for example, to come in and examine how practices are here um, or any other body or organisation under the protocol? Is it open? Um, open any sort of possibility for that to happen it doesn't it wouldn't allow the it wouldn't, doesn't allow the uk government to um to to do anything it, it couldn't already do um uh, it doesn't um allow the uk government um to to um you know, interfere or tell us uh, uh, to do anything uh, anything more or, or uh, and uh, that would be strongly resisted by 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 some of our Scottish and Welsh colleagues. That's for, that's for sure. Um, uh, if if it did, um, so uh, uh, as for as for resources um, and and, allow, and uh, allowing us to do things, um, generally cooperation across jurisdictions is is. Um, is a saving of resources and, and a helpful resources if we you know if a, if a consultation goes out um, uh, across the UK at the same time on some areas um, and we'll do that's where sensible but when where where ministers decide to take uh, a Northern Ireland uh, different approach then we'll continue to do so okay under the protocol is there any other um, bodies that, that could come in and either work with us or examine how practices are here on the ground? No. Well, the the, the EU, because because of the areas where 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 we have to apply EU law, then the the Commission uh, will the European Commission will retain oversight of those areas as it does at the minute, and when the or when and if the Assembly. Um, uh, agree implements the uh, environment bill uh, and the office of environmental protection then that would probably be the 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 new body that um well that will would be the new body that would have that uh, an environmental oversight role including on on waste and that would replace um what we've uh, left behind uh in terms of eu oversight of those areas of the environment that aren't covered by the Northern Ireland Protocol. Okay, thank you very much. Cheers. Okay, thank you, Chair. Harry? Okay, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Janice and John. Um, I'm just wondering how will the framework interact with other frameworks with which it intersects and what are the arrangements for reviewing and changing the framework? Thank you. Um, do you want to get that done? Sure. So um, it interacts as in um, we've we've made it aware in each of the frameworks where there is intersections. So, for example, in the chemicals framework, there'll be a reference to this one and vice versa. Um, and sorry, what was the second part of your question? Um, what what are the arrangements for reviewing and changing the framework? Oh. 
Sure. So um, w once we have it agreed, um, there'll be an initial review at the six month period. And then after that, there'll be a year's review and then we'll go to a three yearly review. Um, but there's also a provision in it um, which allows if something really unusual happens or there's been severe disruption or other reason, then we can do um, a, a sort of an ad hoc review as well. Okay, and Janice, what's the timeline for the development of the framework, including committee scrutiny and implementation data, etc.? So, so the, um, the, all of them are going on mass to the um, JMC shortly um, to be agreed and signed off for phase three there, and then um, we, we we start phase four at official level following that and, and we'll have a look at it again in light of we're, we're now through the transition period um we now have the agreement with the EU, eu on trade and and um we'll engage with stakeholders and yourselves as well you'll actually get the the, yeah. the framework next time around the summary document um and then once we've gone through that process um it'll go off through the, the ministerial structure again and we'll start to operate the framework so that and operating the framework is phase five so with, within this next 12 month period we should be through those two final phases okay thank you very much thank you chair thank you william uh, sorry right this time um okay i'd like to take the opportunity now uh janice and robert and john thank you very much for uh coming before the committee this morning uh, and answering all our questions and providing very comprehensive briefing on this framework. So, again, uh, thank you very much, um, and we'll, we'll see you again. Okay, thank you now. Okay, members? Thank you. Okay, uh, we're going to move on now. Uh, okay, all the best now, John, Robert, and Janice. Um, move on item eight on your agenda. It's a written briefing from DERA, Fluorinated Gas, Greenhouse Gases and Controls on Ozone Depleting Substances Amendment. Regulations 2020. Uh, the memo is at from the clerk is page 93 and 95, and paper from the department 96 to 102. This SL1 was considered by us the, at the committee here on the 19th of November, and members indicated that they were content with the merits of the policy, and the rule is subject to, to a negative resolution procedure. The regulations uh, make amendments to legislation in the field of ozone depleting substances and fluorinated greenhouse gases. The long-term environmental aim of these regulations is to preserve the earth's protective ozone layer and to limit the emissions of greenhouse gases which exacerbate the greenhouse effect. Previously, amendment, amended legislation was drafted in anticipation of a complete exit from the EU to remove all references to the EU legislation for this jurisdiction on F gases and ODS. As this jurisdiction now still retains some responsibilities to the European Commission under the protocol, some requirements for businesses which use ODS and F gases are reinstated through these regulations. The examiner of the rules has not yet reported on the rule, therefore members will be agreeing to the rule subject to examiner's report. Um, members, any comments you want to make in relation to this? Okay. Um, yeah, just... Sorry, Rosemary. Okay. Um, I'm, I have changed. I'll not be agreeing to the rules. Okay. Uh, do, do, do you want to raise it with any officials, Rose, because they're, they're, they're on standby? Yeah. Yes, if they're okay. Yes, we have uh, Colin uh, Nugent on standby, Environmental Policy Advisor and Health uh, Officer. Colin, can you come in there? Colin, Rosemary wants to maybe uh, raise a question with you. Uh, good morning, Chair. Good morning, Committee. Um, I, I didn't actually catch a, a question, so if yeah, you could... Rosemary, you want to... Colin, uh, Rosemary here, can I ask you... Uh, how the, what way the protocol will play out with this uh, legislation? Yes, that's a good question. Um, I have briefed you before in relation to the uh, policy framework for the, the UK in relation to F gases and ODS and also in relation to uh, UK-wide uh, statutory instruments in relation to uh, EU exit. Um, uh, Basically, the uh, Northern Ireland Protocol requires that Northern Ireland remains in line with the EU legislation in this regard, and that's one reason why this uh, statutory rule is before you today. It simply makes amendments to previous EU exit uh, rules that would needed to be corrected to ensure that Northern Ireland remains with the EU legislation. Okay, right. Okay. Thank you. Do you want to note your objection? Yeah. Okay. okay, we'll go to note, we'll go to note of Jackson, and we'll just put the question then, okay? 
the Committee for Agriculture and Environmental Affairs considered SR 202304 a Clearnet Greenhouse Gas Controls on Nose on Depleting Substances Amendment EU Exit Regulations NA 2020 and subject to the examiner's statutory rules has no objection to a rule. Okay. And with no well, yeah. We abstain on that matter. We abstain on it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Chair, Chair, before we leave that, yes. might it be possible for officials to clarify? I'll apologise. I thought I had raised my hand electronically there and, and actually hadn't done it. But can, can we have a clarify that if we were to object, um, or, or if we were second to block, to block something that has already happened in any case, um, that that scenario would leave officials and all of us in a situation where there were no mechanisms or uh, there was no cover in place whatsoever. Can the officials confirm that? Can you pick up on that? Uh, I, I'm, I've heard the question, but I'm not entirely clear what the, the meaning is. But uh, the legislation we have introduced and that you're looking at today ensures that the EU law does still apply in Northern yeah. Ireland. So there is no policy change in relation to this issue. So it's it's a case of business as usual, if you like, in terms of the controls. Yeah, but, but the, the failure to pass the, the law to, to retain what's there in, uh, already would leave us with no cover on the issue whatsoever. Yes, I think that would be a fair interpretation. Yeah, and I think we need to be mindful of that. Thank you. Okay, uh, members, members, okay, we we note this rule then. Okay. Great. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, no. The um, item nine. Th- thank you, Colin. Uh, by the way. Thank you for that. Thank you, Chair. Um, item nine in the agenda is a written briefing, SR 2023-19, the Seed Marketing and Fertilisers Amendment EU Regulations 2020. Uh, the memo from the clerk is page 104 to 107, corresponds to Department 108 to 119. I want to advise members that the committee first considered the SL1 at the meeting of the 3rd of December, and we're content with the merits of the policy and that should progress to the next legislative stage. The purpose of the SR is to implement the EU withdrawal agreement and the protocol in relation to the marketing of agriculture, seed and fertilizers in this jurisdiction. The SR amends the seed marketing regulations NA 2016 to amend to implement the protocol in respect of seed of cereal, beet, vegetables and oil and fibre plants. The EU directive on fodder seed has been omitted from the protocol. The, um, the, the rule provides for the marketing of fodder seed to continue under the UK regime and provides for fodder seed, which has been certified in the EU, to be marketed in this jurisdiction under the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development Trade Rules. The 2016 regulations are also amended to reflect differences in labelling requirements. In this jurisdiction, there has been there had been two regulatory frameworks, a domestic framework, uh, which is the Fertiliser Regulations NA 1992, and the EU regulatory framework uh, EC 20. 203-203, given effect in, the, in this jurisdiction by the EEC Fertilisers Regulations NA 2006. The vast majority of fertilisers are marketed as EC fertilisers. Regulation EC number 203-203 is listed at Annex 2 of the Protocol, meaning that Regulation EC 203-203 will continue to apply here, whereas the retained version of the regulation applies to uh, Britain. The regulations amend the 2006 EC Fertilisers Regulations NA to reflect the fact that this jurisdiction is no longer part of the EU. The regulations also amend the 1992 NA regulation to permit the marketing of fertilizers designated as UK fertilizers in this jurisdiction without prejudice to the application in this jurisdiction of regulation EC number 2003-2003. The examiner's statutory rules has not yet reported on the rule, therefore members will be agreeing to the rule subject to the examiner's report. Uh, the following dear official is in attention. Anyone have any questions? Are there any questions I want to ask? John, is, is that your hand up from before, or is this a fresh hand up? Um, sorry, it's up from before. <laughs> That's okay. Sorry, John, I missed it from before, so I apologise for that previously. So, um, no comments from members then? Okay, I'll put the question that the Committee for Agriculture and Environmental Rural Affairs considered as our 2023-19, the Seed Marketing and Fertilisers Amendment EU Exit Regulations NA 2020 and subject to examiner such rules report has no objection to a rule. Okay, move on. 
Okay, okay. Um, the uh, number 10, we have a written briefing, DERA, Future Investments, uh, Future Programs, Investments in Education Policy, CAFRI. The written briefing at 121 to 126 year PAC, and the briefing advises that the Minister has agreed to the following in relation to CAFRI, widening the course provision, correct development, significant capital investment in state of the art uh, at Green Mountain and Lochray, and a new FE student financial support policy from 2021, a new uh, HE tuition fee policy from 2022. The Minister intends to make a public announcement of these decisions in the new year. Members, any comments? Enough. Okay. Um, number eleven. Written briefing. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead, Philip. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, I have just a couple of points. I mean, uh, in relation to to, to to this. I mean, I'm wondering if if we're given that this is a, a written briefing, if if we can submit uh, some maybe questions, because I have a list of questions here, uh, and I'm conscious that we don't have officials. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, for, well, what it would you want to? Do you want to send them into Stella? No, I think I'd probably be better just sending them into Stella and then maybe forwarding them on to the department, maybe for a written answer. Yeah, yeah. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Members okay with that? Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you for that now. Um, okay. Okay. COVID-19 update, num item number 11 on the thing, uh, on, the, on their pack. Uh, it's page 128 to 137. So briefing uh, are from CAFRI, the Veterinary and Animal Health Group, the Environment, Marine and Fisheries Group, NAEA and Rural Division. Uh, it says written briefing. So do members have any questions they want to raise in relation to this written briefing? That can be passed into the department. Okay. Um, so if there's any more questions in relation to the written briefing, can you further pass them on to Stella? By the close of play today. Okay, there's a written briefing from the department, item 12 in your agenda, EU exit transition. It's page 139 to 151. Um, the department advised that the information contained in the briefing is up to date as of the 6th of January. Uh, members received a verbal update on the 7th of January and have requested fortnightly updates uh, thereafter. Um, members, any questions? If you have any questions, or if you, if you have any questions right now, and you do have subsequently have questions, could you fire them on to Stella by the close of play today? Bobby or, or Mary? Okay. There's a number of issues that are come to light every day, I think, on, on the uh, issue. I think uh, there's, a, there's an issue with steel, 25% tax. If it comes into the UK and comes out of Northern Ireland, I think that has to be sorted. I think that's uh, going to leave a lot of people at a very big disadvantage here. Engineering companies can't operate. In that situation, um, I think a tractor dealer on a few minutes ago, and he's waiting on a tractor, to pour a number of tractors for four weeks now, and he can't. Depper has to check these tractors before they come to Northern Ireland. Like, I mean, uh, there's a number of things that have to happen, and they can't get that done. And there's a lot of things sitting in the. Uh, this is unacceptable for dealerships in Northern Ireland. They, they, they buy these New Holland tractors off New Holland in England. They can't get them in. They have to be inspected by Depper, seemingly. And, Okay. They, can, they can't get them to do that, so they're sitting waiting and these tractors come and they can't get them. The, the issue of, of the tariff on steel, probably a bit more with the economy committee, oh, but yeah, that's right. the tractor, yeah. I can write to Deira about it, okay. that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, because obviously the tractor has an implication for the farm and rural affairs. If you want, I'll, I'll, I will send an email to the, 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 the economy actually committee. The company that rang me, makes all agricultural machinery in yeah. the main, mm -hmm. so that's, that's mm -hmm. why I mentioned it, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, yeah, Go ahead, um, if I could venture as well, um, that's probably a cross departmental issue because the tariffs issue and uh, these post Brexit duties that are coming in or have been imposed is probably an issue via finance for the Chancellor and uh, Michael Gove as well. Um, so there, there's a fair bit of cross departmental stuff here, but principally for, for Westminster uh, and those two departments. I know I would, I would agree with Willie, um, insofar as it's having implications uh, in, in my constituency, big rural constituency here, which has a uh, heavy reliance on uh, light and heavy uh, engineering manufacturing. Um, and those, the imposition of, of tariffs post Brexit, 
would have serious consequences for them. So any representations that we could make uh, through to those uh, relevant departments at Westminster via whichever minister it is, whether it's through DERA or whether it's the Department of Finance or both of them, I think that will be uh, deeply uh, appreciated by those industries and the people employed in them. Thank you. That's add, noted, and we'll do that. I can add a line letter one to Minister Grove, if you want. Yeah. Did you hear that, Patsy? Uh, Stella, can I include that in letter one to Minister Grove? Yes, that would be great, Di. Thank you. Okay. So, remember, is there anything else you want to just uh, uh, email them to Stella by the close of play today? If there's anything else you want to include, okay? Um, okay, members, uh, item 13 on the agenda. Um, is the uh, NAEA regulatory charging policy from 1st of April to 31st of March 2023. Uh, papers are page 153 till uh, 154 in your packs from the department. I want to advise that the, the Minister has approved a public consultation on the extension of the current uh, Environment Agency NAEA regulatory charging policy from 1st of April 21 to the 31st of March 23. Policy covers the fees and charges associated with waste, water and pollution control regulations. This current policy expires on the 31st of March this year. So, <coughs> consequently, a new charging policy needs to be introduced setting out the charging arrangements. The consultation seeks comments on the proposal to extend the policy for a further two years until 2023, during which time NAEA will undertake a comprehensive written balance review of its current regulatory charging policy and develop a new policy in line with legislative framework. It proposed that the consultation will commence on Monday, the 18th of January, and will last for eight weeks. The final, process, uh, are, are the final responses are sought from consultees by the 15th of March at 12 noon. Uh, members, any, um, uh, any comments to make on that there? Or, um, that um, are you content that we maybe ask the department for a follow-up of the analysis of the consultation responses? Will that be fair enough? Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to bring you now to item 14. Uh, correspondence. We have a, a fair bit of correspondence, pages 169 to 916 in your packs, uh, that there's around 750 pages of correspondence this week. Uh, okay, I want, there's a couple I want to bring attention to. The page 389 to 386 is a response from the Department on Issues uh, raised by the Ultra Angling Federation at an informal meeting on the 24th of November. The issues included the decline in water quality and failure to meet water framework directive targets, as well as the lack of appointment of an angling development officer or the promotion of angling by either inland fisheries or NOx agency. I seek uh, agreement to forward the response from the department to the Ulster Angling Federation for information. And can I also uh, seek agreement to request an oral briefing from the department on water quality targets? Okay. Page 403 to 404 is a response from Tourism and I regarding the marketing of angling as a sport. Are we okay to forward that response to UAF, Ulster Angling Federation? Okay. Page 405 to 408 contains copied correspondence from the Committee for the Executive Office to the First and Deputy First Minister on the Common Framework Process. Can I seek agreement to request that the Executive Committee uh, copies this committee into the response when it is received? Uh, page 416 to 536 is a series of copied correspondence from Jim Shannon, MP, regarding a judicial review of the DFP Barnwell Farm case. The correspondent has been in contact with the clerk and indicated that he would like to encourage the committee to undertake an inquiry into this matter with the aim of getting paid in all, uh, by the end of this year. Change would be around the role of the independent panel in the review of decisions procedure. The correspondent has also indicated the clerk that he is happy for her to pass the telephone number to an individual mem any individual members they wish to contact him directly. The correspondent also this morning provided copies of a newspaper article from the Irish Farmers Journal and a 21-page summary of um, um, and a one-page interview with Mr. Shannon MP and Mr. Mercer QC. You requested that members receive this in time for the meeting today, and the clerk subsequently sent it out that information by email this morning. We are due to receive a departmental briefing on the 28th of January on the role of the independent panels of review of decisions. Uh, as we know, Minister Pritch has already made it clear, speaking in the Assembly, that he does not intend to overrule the recommendations of the independent uh, panel. Um, uh, do you remember, um, have any sort of, uh, remember, if we wish to bring this, uh, to give evidence, would you remind that, the, that um, it's difficult for us to get involved in, in, in individual cases, um, and we all know uh, from rural areas how difficult it's been in terms of 
these panels and very frustrating in occasions when you go to an independent panel and there's experts there, uh, yet the department uh, doesn't have to take on board uh, what those panels are saying and it feels like a, a wasted exercise. It's very, very frustrating for panel for 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 the the, the, app, the, the appellant. Uh, so members wanna but well, you want to pick up on that? Yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. I think most of us as MLAs has come across this problem. I think if you've represented constituents, I mean, uh, in the past where uh, cross compliance issues were risen and um, farmers decided to go to an independent panel and pay to do it, actually. Um, an independent panel, the experts made a decision on a number of cases the department overruled and didn't accept the independent panel's decision, and I think that's grossly wrong and unfair. I think we need to look into that. Rosemary? Yeah, very often the um, independent panel gives you their decision and they give you the reasons for their decision. Next thing, the department overrule that, but you don't seem to get any reasons as to why they've overruled it and what their, what their concerns are when they do overrule it. I think, Mr Chairman, the very fact that they overruled it, why have an independent panel, panel if and you don't accept, accept the pain? So. Yeah. I think the, the challenge for a lot of farmers as well is that whenever they don't, don't get the appropriate, or whenever they, they don't get a resolution at the independent panel, they only have recourse to the courts, and that uh, result in... It's an expense. And it's, it's, it's not possible. So many farmers just walk walk away at that stage. So um, yeah. that there's there's a very strong feeling that um, I know the minister has a strong feeling on, on as well that uh, that this needs to be addressed. Um, does members have any views on? Uh, obviously, we can't discuss individual cases, but as members have any views on how we could potentially move ahead with considering this matter further? No, Claire, would, would it be? Sorry, hand up, Claire. Sorry, Claire. Sorry, Claire. So I thought it was muted there. Uh, apologies. I just wanted to ask, in terms of, do we have, as a committee, do we have any legal constraints on what we can do here? I know that this is the second time that Jim Shannon has contacted us with this one, and there are hefty papers, and there's a lot of detail in there. Um, is there anything as a committee we can actually do about that, or are our hands tied? Well, it wouldn't be beyond our remit to to um to to look at like like a like a mini inquiry or look look at from an inquiry point of view, like just like we did, whenever we sent out a call for evidence uh, as regards the um the, the 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 scheme the COVID support scheme that the minister announced. So there there are options where we where we could do to explore this in more detail. Um, we have the department before us on this day two weeks um on this very subject as well. So that there are options for us. Because I know that there's other, I mean, I've been contacted, I know that there's other issues in terms, I know that this is an independent panel, but a lot of these cases that go through, say, an appeals commission and other um, channels, you know, and when that decision is made, it, you know, really what I'm trying to find out, is that final or how do you challenge that further, if possible at all? Well, whenever, whenever the independent panel, which is stage two in the process, make a decision, the department doesn't have to take that decision on board, and that's, that leaves farmers with, with no other recourse other than going to the courts at a, at a, at a, at a huge cost, and many of them walk away at that stage, Claire, and I think that's, that's, that's a crux of the yeah, problem. No, I completely understand that, you know, but I, mean, I know we're talking about farmers, but you know, this is the system in its entirety. It doesn't just apply to farmers. I know a lot of individuals or other cases that are going on you know and, and if there's a disagreement then all you're left with is a judicial review um and that is seriously costly process as you're pointing out um yeah so i just wanted to know if there was something in between that yeah. that could be done i'm going to try and give you order we said rosemary's first then patsy and i'll come back to you william so rosemary yeah. sorry rosemary sorry, i thought you'd indicate patsy sorry patsy yeah Chair, just piggybacking on what uh, Claire had raised there, I think it would be crucially important that we get reasons for the department refusing to implement the decision of the independent panel, right? Now, why I'm, why I'm going there is, I want to know, it's just not enough for the department to say this is going to be costly for us, right? Uh, and, and I want the detailed reason. Now, they don't have to go into the specifics because of data protection, but if, if it is solely and exclusively that it's going to cost the department, in my book, that's not a good reason. Okay. William? Yeah, Sorry. Yeah, I I mean, what I mean is, Declan, I didn't explain there. If we could have 
the number of cases from the department over this last, say, two, three years, whatever it is, where the department did not comply with the decision of the independent panel and leading on from that, the reason why not. I think that would be very important for us to consider that. Please. Yeah. William? Can I say that? Yeah, that, and that happened and there's a judicial, judicial review recently, a few months back, where the department would cost the department and, well, the department a lot of money and had to pay the, the lady concerned. So, mm -hmm. you know, very few people, as the chairman said, can afford to go to the judicial re review because mm -hmm. it's a lot, lot, a lot of money. So you, you understand when most people walk away from it and, and just accept the, the fine because they can't afford to fight that in court. I think. Claire maybe didn't fully understand this across compliance issues, so it does relate in to farmers in the main old only as a cross compliance issue whereby there are penalties uh, put on an across compliance issue by the Department of Agriculture, then that's challenged and go to an independent panel uh, and in the main uh, well uh, exclusively it's farmers that's involved in that. Yeah. Yeah, no, thanks for that, um, William. I, I do understand that, but what I was trying to talk about was the, the, the same system applies um, across the, the wider sector, you know, so this is the specific one for the farmers, but in terms of planning, for example, you know, um, people then have to go to the Planning Appeal Commission um, and that decision is final and the only recourse, if you disagree, is exactly the same channel. It's only judicial review. So it comes down to that case of um, people, um, you know, denied access to justice or processes um, because it's too costly. So they're priced out. Yeah. That's the only comparison we're making, sorry. Yeah. I think the... the the information was provided to us was there is that in a third of the cases, DERA rejects the view of the independent panel, which is quite substantial. And obviously, it leads, it leads to question as to you know, wh wh why you go through the cost and resource of it if ultimately DERA can do its own thing anyway. So I think that's, that's one of the most frustrating and burning issues that um, people experience who, who, who go down the route of going to those panels. So um, do we want to... Uh, what, what, do, what do you want to maybe raise these issues from the department when they come up again in, in, in a fortnight's time? Would that would be fair to say? Or what, what, I remember any. I think we need to look into this. I think we need to look into it in detail. I think there's no doubt about that, and, and challenge the department on this issue. Yeah. Yeah. And will we will we will we will we forward some of these issues that we raised today to the department, department to include in the briefing mm -hmm. with us in a fortnight's time, and then we can plot our way forward. Of course, mm -hmm. right. Well, that's okay. Yeah. And you can decide your way forward it, after it, you speak to the department. We can way yeah. forward after I, think, I think it may be good to speak to other stakeholders yeah. also at some stage. Yeah, I, th I would agree with that. Yeah. But I think, I think in the first instance we should do that there and then we can branch it out to others to get their view of their, their view and their experiences of the process. That's okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Thank you very much, folks. Um, okay. Um, again, on page, going back to correspondence, page 537, a letter from the Minister on issues arising out of the importation of sheep from Scotland. Uh, the Minister advises that although a derogation was sought, it was not granted. The European Commission advising that there is no room for manoeuvre. The Minister continues to raise the issue. I seek agreement that we write to the Minister to request that he keeps us updated on any developments. And we can include this letter in our letter to Minister Gove. Yep. Okay. okay um, Page 569, a briefing which has been forwarded to us by the NIFF outlining the difficulties and impact of the trade deal on local fishing communities. Can I seek agreement to invite NIFF to brief the committee on these issues? Um, we already have an oral briefing from the Department Schedule on Fisheries and the trade deal, so it would be appropriate to hear from NIFF also. Is that okay? I just I know that last week with the the, the officials um, and I'd asked for an update on fishing or the impact of it at our committee meeting and they said that they would forward I think David Small wasn't available on the, the line and they said they would forward any details did anything come through you? Nothing as yet, um, Claire Thanks. We've got the oral briefing in. Got the oral briefing? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay um Page 574, written brief from the Department on the SA on international waste shipments. This is a reserve matter and is there for, for noting only. However, it would appear that that uh, may be a new financial burden on waste operators here. Can I seek agreement to the right to the Department to request that the Committee has kept up to date on the ongoing discussions regarding this matter? Yeah. Okay. 
The 18th report from the Examiner Statute of Rules, which has been tabled, invites members that the ESR has drawn attention to two SRs which the committee approved at the meeting on the 17th of December. SR 2020-293, the Plant Health Regulations 2020, and SR 2020-301, the Seed Marketing Regulations 2020. The ESR advised that both SRs contain a number of drafting errors, which the Department will correct at the earliest opportunity. We seek agreement to action the remainder of the correspondence as suggested in the index pages 157 to 167. Okay. Uh, forward work program. Um, uh, it's draft forward work program 918 to 924 on your packs. Uh, ask members to note that next week we'll have a briefing from DERA on the 15 common frameworks uh, that the committee is expected to scrutinise over the coming months. At the end of that briefing, the committee will go into closed session to discuss its, its approach to these common frameworks. We'll also hear from Lock Agency on its roles and remit and get an update on the main, main bog um, land, land, landslide. The meeting of the 21st January will start at 10 a.m. The following meeting on the 20th of January is proposed to be here from DERA and the two local fish producer organisations on the implications of EU exit in the fishing industry. We'll also hear from DERA on the role of the independent panels in the review of decisions. That meeting may need to start at 9.30am. Members are OK that with the work programme for 21st and 28th of January. After the 20th of January, we're likely to see the common frameworks begin to appear on the committee agenda. Is that OK? Uh, and the clerk will be in touch with DERA regarding what legislation requires you bring to the committee uh, in this term. Uh, are we OK? Can we agree on the Fire Work Programme? Okay. Yeah. OK, in terms of any other business, uh, Patsy has a number of issues that he uh, wishes to raise, on, uh, particularly in relation to the payment for the Loch Ness Eel uh, Fisheries, the Waste Crime at Maboy, and the Farm Welfare Bill. Patsy, do you want to pick up on those uh, issues? Sure. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair, and, and yeah. thank you, and, and Stella. Sorry, I thought it'd be on the agenda, agenda formally, but that's okay. We're raising it now. Um, first things first is support for uh, Loch Ness fishermen. Um, really, this is beyond an embarrassment for the department. Um, the fishermen were those who closed down their operations uh, last summer during the season. Had been anticipating that that there would be payment forthcoming, probably late summer. At the and it's the autumn, and here we're still sitting, and no payment has issued to those fishermen who did stop their activities on the loch, uh, who are legitimate businessmen, and they still haven't received the support that was due to be forthcoming. And the minister had previously reassured the the assembly, in fact, that the support was due. So it it really is beyond embarrassing, and these are people who are anticipating that the money would be paid to them. Um, it really has to be got out there now. Um, the, no harm to anybody, but there's been a bit of ducking and diving whenever the officials did come to the committee about what was going on and uh, answers weren't forthcoming. So if we could get um, a submission, uh, the officials who are responsible for this scheme to come before the committee and provide with us details as to why the money hasn't been forthcoming, it is beyond embarrassing for the department uh, that these people have been, many of whom are on very low incomes as it is and just haven't received the money that is legitimately due to them. Um, the, the second thing is, Chair, if uh, if it could to, I'm receiving some correspondence about the Maboy uh, dump in, up, in, uh, up in Derry. Uh, that one is, is a long-standing one that has been about the place for quite a while uh, would, without apparent conclusion. So if we could, at some stage, if we could make the recommendation that we have the relevant officials uh, come before the committee to explain what the department is, is currently doing. And then finally, it's the issue, it's very much a live issue, and that's um, for fair farm prices, fair farm gate prices. It has been raised by Farmers for Action previously, and I did forward to yourself there some detailed, uh, I know, I think maybe Rosemary has been previously involved in this, as is Claire. Um, with Farmers for Action. And I think it may well be useful, Chair, in the initial stages to have Farmers for Action present to the committee as to what their legislative proposals are. Um, we're, we're into uh, new uncharted waters as a consequence of Brexit for many people economically, socially and other ways. Um, but uh, nonetheless, there are farmers who are trying to eke a living and this, I think, would be a positive contribution towards it the legislative provision for a fair farm gate price and if we could make that recommendation to chair to the committee and members of the committee uh, that, that we uh, move in that to invite them to explain just their legislative proposals 
and inform us a bit better as a committee before the committee would lift them or other ways. Thanks, Chair, very much for your time. Could, could Rosemary? I, could I ask just as an additive to that? Is it possible to have a research paper on that? I know there was one done a few years ago in relation to, in relation to that. Yeah. But it, we're out of the out of Europe now, so to speak, and what would the differences be? It might be better to also bring Dara up to talk about it. Yeah. Really? I'm just uh, curious, um, in terms of the, the, pay, the COVID payments to the fishermen, have we requested from the Minister before a breakdown? I mean, there was a substantial um, money set aside from his COVID, from the department's COVID funding um, for the, the sector. And did we ever request a breakdown of where the payments went? Well, I think this particular scheme, my understanding was that this was, this was to be funded in the European um, Marine and Fisheries Fund. Right? Okay. Uh, uh, that's, that, right. that's, that's where this one was to be funded from, and it really, it is astonishing that this hasn't been released as yet now, you know, so it would be fair to put the pressure on there. Apologies, okay, thanks. Um, uh, William? Yeah, we're still in open session, aren't we? Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, in, in relation to uh, legislation on, on fixed prices, it would be very good if it was workable, I think, yes, but the difficulty is that if you legislate to have a price higher than the market price, how do you sell your produce? You know, it's a difficult one. But it's, it's worth looking at, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So are we, are we okay with uh, agreeing with Patsy's uh, suggestions in our, around the eels, the uh, Maboy and the getting the farmers for action until uh, come to the committee and explain in detail yeah. and we That's can ask okay. questions of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. Thank you. Um, uh, folks, anything else you want to raise before we close down? Chair, Chair, just one point. Go ahead, Morris. Uh, is there a, the, the uh, farm welfare bill, is, is that not in front of us, surely? Sorry, Morris? The farmers welfare bill. That's the, the, the draft, the proposed draft legislation from the Farmers for Action, Morris. Yeah, that, that's it. That's, that, that's what uh, that's what Patsy was on about. Yes. Aye. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, um, you know that. Yeah, certainly, I'm 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 up for having a presentation from them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Morris. Okay, members. So, the date and time of the next meeting is the 24th of January at 10 a.m. in room 30, this room here, or in building. So, I want to thank you all and go to adjourn the meeting now. Okay. John, are you looking in there? No, we just we haven't got that. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.